Uh, are we ready to go again? Okay, members, sorry about that. Uh, we had a technical issue here, and now we're ready to start again. Uh, as well as Councillors Robert Irvine and Councillor Mary Garde, we now have Councillor Anthony Feely and Councillor Chris McCaffrey have joined us in the chamber. And uh, I'll be taking a time about as well, one first from the chamber and then once one from the internet. Uh, so uh, we'll go to, to Director John News for uh, 5.1. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so 5.1 is the uh, State Matters Report uh, on, uh, on on general state matters up to the period 1st of June. Uh, so uh, Section 2 sets out a number of uh, key issues for decision. These are, uh, by and large, uh, legal and conveyancing issues to do with uh, easement of lands. So 2.1, it's uh, lands at Tully Castle and Derry Gonley. Uh, and uh, consideration of easements with uh, two landowners. Uh, uh, 2.2 is a uh, reference lands at Sycamore Drive and Kevin Alec and the request from the developer uh, to uh, open lands or to, for an easement of, of uh, for a pipe uh, to the back of uh, uh, housing uh, development there. Uh, 2.3 is uh, Kesh Jetty Muck Ross uh, and again uh, it's uh, work with uh, Waterways Ireland uh, to the, uh, reopen uh, the jetty uh, there. Uh, 2.4 is a partnership collaboration with Southwest College in respect of Enniskill and Workhouse. Uh, 2.5, Gorch and Glen Forest Park Cafe and a request to operate a, a horse box trailer to sell ice cream uh, at peak times over the uh, the next six months uh, with a, 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 the uh, charge to be determined by LPS. Uh, 2.6 is lands at Latoon Road in uh, Bell Coo. And uh, again, uh, working closely with the uh, Bell Coo uh, Community Centre and the, the play group uh, to extend their existing uh, play park provision. 2.7 is uh, <coughs> the creation of a temporary equipment storage facility uh, to facilitate the works at uh, the Grange Play Park being undertaken by uh, Garden Escapes. 2.8 is uh, a request uh, to install a, a memorial plaque on the, the Corner Grade Riverside in Enniskillen, uh, and that's been uh, submitted in accordance with the, the Council's policy and the uh, relevant application uh, fee has been received as well. Uh, 2.9 sets out a number of uh, requests for use of uh, Council property, uh, and uh, 2.10 a number of uh, retrospective uh, uses of Council property. So. Uh, Recommendations are set out there. Uh, Council's asked to approve uh, 9.1.1 uh, through to uh, 10, and the Council notes uh, the 9.211. Thank you, John. And uh, first indicating I have Councillor Robert Irvine in the chamber. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, I have two questions in regard to the report. Uh, first one's under 2.4 in Skill and Workhouse. Uh, John, uh, the 10 year lease, I know at nominal rent, is that a full repairing lease uh, in regard to are they going to return the property at the end of 10 years in the way that it's being handed over to them? And obviously, will you carry out a full schedule of dilapidations or at least? Uh, uh, a schedule report prior to handover, and then um, when it's handed back, then we can compare that. The second one is 2.5, Chair, a bit of latitude. Um, we had a meeting with Forest Service this afternoon on, on WebEx. Um, several members asked questions. I asked three or four in particular. I don't believe I got a cognitive reply to them. I did get a, a reply but they didn't really answer the question I put to them. And because of the limitation of time, I would ask both directors, that's Director Boyle and Director News, to send a letter to John Joe Boyle with the following headings. One, I raised the query in regard to their legislative requirement around the forest estate in regard to the provision of leisure. Uh, we have highlighted in this council over the last number of years that we as a council are increasingly entering into MOUs to take over that responsibility from council. Um, but whilst we can draw down capital uh, money for any of the projects uh, that we want to do, and that's particularly evident in Gorton Glen Forest, 
we have no access at all to any revenue resource. Um, that was fleetingly uh, responded to my question by John Joel Boyle, and he didn't address the issue in that whenever we do any works, upgrade, whatever, we have a revenue consequence, both small and great. Uh, I want to push the Forest Service to see if that some of their annual budget has been applied for that and whether we can actually draw that down. Secondly, I asked about ash dieback throughout their estate. The reason I was asking, and I never really got the chance to follow up, was there is a commitment, obviously, to cut back those trees that are dying. To the um, issue of trying to identify um, a strain of ash coming forward that is resistant to the disease so that they can actually replant. But my main issue is as well, they seem to be like some of the other large organisations, merely cutting and leaving to rot. They're not actually processing the timber. And I believe there is a market that could be available for that timber if they would actually go out into the marketplace and look at it. I know there would be issues of liability for third parties coming into their property uh, or their estate, but those can be overcome. The third is a tide to my original question with regard to a revenue stream that should be coming to us as a council and indeed other councils. The MOUs that we enter into aren't necessarily for the areas of the forest estate that we are actually going to develop. What they do is they seem to ask us to enter into an area in its entirety and they are abdicating or would seem to be abdicating any of the responsibility in regard to the upkeep of that area, uh, whilst we actually undertake um, improvement works and leisure, uh, basically through the tracks and uh, whatever infrastructure we're going to go in. Uh, I would like, again, that there is some sort of revenue uh, consequence coming to us where we actually have to take up part of what should be their cost for the maintenance, the long-term maintenance of this estate. I would appreciate if a letter was sent, and that's my proposal, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I go on to Councillor Adam Gadden on WebEx. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm uh, happy, and good luck for the year ahead, John, by the way. Uh, I'm happy to uh, second uh, or proposer second the report there i was didn't quite catch whether robert proposed it but i'll second it if he has and i'll propose it if he hasn't but i just wanted to particularly note 2.6 <clears throat> and uh Belcoo community playgroup brilliant project uh, great to see uh the funding they've received and uh great project to develop the play provision there um but thank you chair thank you and go to uh councillor anthony philly in the chamber Thank you, John, and I'd um, like to wish you best of luck for the year ahead on your appointment as being chair of this committee. Fair play to you. Yeah, I was um, coming in on 2.1 and 2.6. Hopefully, the, that can be sorted out in 2.1 or totally chaos for that to keep that um, lane with fixed in and out there. And it's looking like it, it's just going to be done, so that's good. And 2.6 about the the um, community centre in Belt in Bel Coup and the play group is great to see that funding for that. Uh, extra equipment and the 25 year lease that we're, they're going to go in with them at uh, the belt the community group's happy with that and and, and that's they're happy enough with that that's what i was wondering and if um a second rob is proposed uh, if you're looking for a second for it okay thank you anthony and we go to councillor alex baird on webex thank you chair and like uh, everyone else there we look forward to you having a successful um uh, professional and productive year in the chair best wishes just want to comment on two one the lands of tully castle tully castle is a, a on the one hand it's, it's a bit of a hidden gem on the other hand that uh, if you go by the number of people who use it who go down and visit it uh it, it's not a hidden gem but the, the the community association in church hill there do wonderful work and have been involved with church hill so i commend the council for um uh, the, the proposal to uh, take on the maintenance of the entire laneway. It's something I've been working on for some time. 
and uh, the landowners are very cooperative down there. So uh, that is a great initiative and will be a real asset to Tully and the residents of the area. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. I'm going to go to Councillor Mary Garty in the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I believe Robert didn't propose, so I'll second the, the report. And just to say I'm supportive of the proposal by Councillor Irvine, seconded by Councillor Feely as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, I've heard the, uh, the uh, report proposed and seconded proposed by Councillor Gallen and seconded by Councillor Anthony Feely, I think. Or was it? No? Or, or it's proposed by Councillor Gallen. Did you propose it, Robert? No. No. So then it's proposed by Councillor Gallen and seconded or right? and seconded by Councillor Gardy. And then is, is there anybody to the contrary with that? Not seeing anything indicated. And then we've heard the proposals for from Councillor Irvine to go back to the forestry, and that's been seconded by Councillor Anthony Feely. And I think we're all in agreement with that one as well. I'm not seeing any indications to the contrary, so we'll take that as passed as well. Next, we go on to item 5.2, which is the draft policy for assisted bin lifts, etc. So again, we're going to John News for this one. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh... Uh, members will recall that uh, a previous draft of this uh, policy uh, came to Environment and Services in March 2022 and uh, members uh, had uh, raised a couple of points uh, that they wanted to see included in, in the revised policy, including the uh, removal of the requirement for an applicant to provide a medical certificate and provision for officers to take into account on-site considerations as part of the uh, renewal process. Uh, so th those amendments have now been reflected into the, the redrafted policy uh, and it has been uh, screened uh, through the, our equality uh, processes and uh, rural impact assessment processes and we've also uh, brought the policy back to Disability Advisory Group. Uh, there were uh, some comments there around language from uh, Disability Advisory Group and they've also been reflected into the, uh, the final uh, draft policy as is presented uh, to members here tonight. Uh, so uh, there, there's three parts essentially now to this policy. There's the assisted bin lift, there's the additional bin collection, and then provision for a larger 360 uh, blue recycling bin uh, service. Uh, and uh, the, the sections are paragraphs 2.1 to 2.9 set out some additional uh, detail in respect of those. Uh, <coughs> Uh, recommendation then is that that uh, council uh, notes the contents of the report and agrees uh, that should be approved the attached uh, assisted bin lift additional bin collection of three hundred and sixty blue recycling bin policy. Thank you, John and Councillor Earl Thompson on Webex. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to Director News for his uh, report. Uh, to me, this is a, a positive report, and I am happy to go to the recommendation and propose accordingly. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to Councillor Anthony Philly in the chamber. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to second this, and I remember when it came up in March because I did speak about it, and I, and I remember that time. It wasn't that many people knew about it, right, that this was going on, and I was just wondering since that... Uh, has any more people started using it since we started talking about it last? I know it's only after, it's long since it was changed. Is that the March is the policy changed lately? Like, is, is, have we any more uptake on it? Because it's, it's a great um, thing we are offering for people who's not fit to lift the bins. As I said, that night in March, I do still put out a bin for a neighbour of mine, but I do just do it anyway. We didn't bother about this. But is there any more of an uptake on it in the last month or two? I was just wondering. Happy to second it. Thank you, Anthony. John, do you want to come back in there? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, we, we get uh, requests, or officers would receive requests for the assisted bin lift uh, uh, on a on, on a I'm going to say on a routine basis. I, I don't have the exact numbers to hand since it was last discussed in committee. But one of the things that uh, we did talk about at the last committee, our members did uh, discuss at the last committee, was that once these policies would be approved, that we will seek to uh, to make sure that they are more visible on on our website. 
uh, so that, that that should also help to uh, raise awareness of uh, the policy. Obviously, it's still a draft policy at this stage on, until uh, subject to members' uh, decision here tonight. So, uh, once it's a, it's a, if it's approved here tonight, then uh, we will uh, seek to continue to raise awareness of it. But there, I mean, we do we do get uh, requests for assisted bin lift and additional bins uh, on a, an ongoing basis. Thank you, John. You've heard the proposal, uh, the recommendations proposed and seconded. Anybody contrary? No, so we'll take it that's passed and we're looking forward to you advancing that one, John. Okay. When I go on to item 5.3 is the consultation report on the draft diversity strategy <laughs> action plan. And again, we're going to you, John News. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, members, the, the purpose of this report is to seek members' approval for the uh, final draft of the, the Council's Biodiversity Strategy uh, following the, the public consultation process. Uh, the report sets out uh, a report on what happened during the consultation process, you know, how we went about the consultation process and the engagement that uh, we received uh, as a result of that consultation process. I think I'd mentioned that some of the numbers in the last meeting, but uh, just uh, reiterating them here. Uh, there was a, a good level of public engagement, 58 responses received in total uh, from 47 in, uh, individuals and in 11 organizations. Uh, very strong endorsement uh, of the uh, of the, the councils of the draft biodiversity strategy uh, and indeed 91% uh, agreeing with the uh, the aims as set out in the strategy, and, and in fact, 98% of the respondents agreeing that biodiversity was an important part of the council's response to climate change and sustainable development. And uh, that's very much the context within which we take forward the the biodiversity uh, strategy. Uh, so over 100 uh, specific points came back from respondents, uh, and they're summarised in, in 2.4. And you know, when we group them, uh, the majority of those comments, it has to be said, uh, were very much into the, the realm of, of specific actions that we will seek to incorporate within the action plan uh, and say, you know, relate to things like education and awareness, uh, strengthening collaboration and partnership, uh, looking at maybe more dynamic and engaging public awareness campaigns and strengthening volunteer uh, engagement. Uh, there were two specific uh, comments that we've just highlighted within in the paper. Uh, one respondent had suggested that uh, perhaps the strategy should have its own vision. Uh, officers did consider this in, in drafting the original uh, uh, the, the consultation draft and, and also reflected on that feedback. Uh, and certainly the view would be that having the uh, United Nations vision for biodiversity uh, front and center in the biodiversity in, in our draft biodiversity strategy and linking that explicitly then with the council's corporate plan uh, avoids any confusion that might arise from having a separate or an, another uh, vision statement uh, in, in another strategy document. Uh, another respondent had also suggested that the word restore should be added into M1 uh, and uh, we have uh, we recommend that that should be taken on board because when we uh, reflected on the detail within the draft document actually the, the the principle of the concept of restoring biodiversity is is woven into the, the very fabric of uh, what we're proposing to do so uh, that has been reflected back into the revised draft as presented here uh, to members uh, tonight for their consideration uh, set out then uh, just some next steps in terms of uh, subject to decision here tonight uh, would be moving to uh, seek to move to launch the strategy uh, as soon as possible and officers are continuing to work through the detail of an action plan uh, that will then uh, go into uh, operational details to how we'll uh, actually implement uh, the uh, the aims and objectives within the, the biodiversity strategy so the recommendation is as set out uh, sorry i should say that obviously the the, the strategy has previously been a uh, quality uh, assessed and also uh, approved uh, in terms of rural needs impact assessment. So recommendation uh, set out in uh, section 8 and uh, specifically uh, 8.2 that uh, council approves the final draft biodiversity strategy in appendix 2 to be launched later this year. Thank you John and we go to councillor Matthew Bell on Webex. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and best of luck as you're uh, in your um, tenure as Chair of this committee. Um, no, it's, it's great to it's great to hear that um, the consultation process was um, was um, quite widespread throughout the district. I'm a great believer that everyone across our district should have a say in in, in how we are governed and what policies we develop. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, um, I'm very happy to propose the recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Um, question for John. Um, as a result of the consultation and the processing of the consultation responses, did the draft plan change in any way? And if so, have you tracked change, the changes within the policy? Uh, because we have a standing um, sort of approach to changes that if a policy has been brought back after either consultation or deliberation in whatever forum, that the track changes are noted before we actually adopt it. So that's the question. Thank you. Uh, Chair, if you're happy, I'll, I'll come back. Yes, in. go ahead, John. Uh, so, uh, uh, my apologies, uh, Chair, if that it's it, it was a final. It's the final draft of the document that's being presented here, rather than the track changes. Uh, from uh, the, the feedback that we received, most of the most of the comments to say there of the hundred responses were to do with specific actions which wouldn't have featured in the, the actual strategy document itself, uh, but they will inform the the action plan which we're developing. So that they didn't. Uh, they didn't necessitate any 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 change to the draft document as went out uh, or as was published. Uh, the one change that, that was noted is at uh, two point six, uh, which was the uh, inclusion of the word restore. Uh, and the aim one previously read is to uh, protect and enhance biodiversity on council managed estate. And in the this final draft, uh, that's now been changed to protect, enhance, and restore biodiversity on council managed estate. Uh, but other than than there may, if there were some typos in it, uh, there weren't any other uh, substantive changes uh, made to the document. What's been brought back is largely a, as as was out the consultation. Other than that, uh, the inclusion of the word restore uh, in the AM one, and that would obviously be, be repeated in a number of places throughout the document. But uh, my apologies, that it's it hasn't been the, the tracked changes version that's been presented here tonight. Thank you, John. I'm going back quickly to you, Robert Irwin. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be pedantic about it, John, but um, it was decided upon about four or five years ago, very much so in that we didn't want to be reading too much documentation just to find out three or four changes. So I'll take what you've said now, but just for future reference, if something like this happens again, please make sure you note what the changes are so we don't read the document or reread the document unnecessarily. Thank you. Okay. And did you second uh, Matthew's proposal, Robert? Okay, thank you. So the proposal has been proposed and seconded, and I'm not seeing anybody uh, going against that. So we'll move on to item 5.5, .5, which is the... Uh, 5.4. Oh, sorry, 5.4, sorry, proposed waste transfer station at Drummond. And this is coming back from the RNC meeting in May. So over to you again, John. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, yes, as, as noted in the paper here, uh, members had raised uh, some questions at uh, Regeneration uh, and Community Committee when the economic appraisal uh, for the, the Drummy Waste Transfer Station was previously uh, uh, considered. Uh, this paper uh, is, uh, provides a response to uh, the, the additional information that was being requested by members at that time. Uh, members may also wish to note that the, the food economic appraisal uh, of the for the waste transfer uh, station has been uploaded into uh, the decision time into the members resource library for, for members information and it sets out in detail the strategic context and uh, the full detailed assessment of the various options that were considered as part of the appraisal process. In terms of some of the questions uh, that were uh, that were flagged during the discussion at RNC uh, last month. Uh, 2.1, we've noted there, the waste hierarchy uh, is the cornerstone of EU waste policy and legislation, and that has very much informed uh, the production of the uh, the, the economic appraisal for the Drummy uh, waste transfer uh, station. Uh, members will also be aware that uh, Drummy Landfill is uh, ex expected to close in uh, quarter two of 2024, uh, and that's based on projections from detailed top uh, topographical uh, studies. Uh, but we, we know that uh, putting uh, waste in the landfill is, uh, is, is the least preferred option when it comes to uh, waste management. 
uh, and a more environmentally responsible and economically sustainable approach is now required, especially as we're uh, in the middle of a, a climate uh, emergency. Uh, so the uh, this uh, the waste transfer uh, station will aim to uh, support the recovery of uh, maximum amount of recyclates and divert residual waste from landfill. Uh, however, we know that even if the landfill closes, that uh, that we as a society we will continue to generate uh, waste and that we'll therefore need to have uh, bulk storage facilities available uh, to uh, transfer that to the nearest uh, residual uh, treatment facility. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, so. Uh, members will also recall uh, from a workshop that we uh, did last year, last November, uh, that we're anticipating further uh, legislative and policy changes uh, within the area of waste management, things like uh, extended producer responsibilities and deposit return schemes. Uh, to name two, uh, and uh, the the provision of the waste transfer shed will uh, provide the resilience that we need to be able to. Uh, 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 deal with those changes as they're coming down the tracks. Uh, council our members are also um, also be recall that we are in the process of establishing a waste transfer uh, transformation project uh, to look at uh, those uh, changes that are coming down the tracks and implications for how we provide uh, services. Uh, so as we've noted there at uh, two point five, the uh, provision of the, the waste transfer shed is a key part of how we uh, expect that we will have to manage waste in the future. Uh, the uh, climate change strategy uh, sets out uh, an aspiration that would be a net zero in council operations by 2040, but that will be a, a journey over the course of the next 18 years. And uh, this uh, the waste transfer uh, station will uh, be a, a key part of that journey over that period of time, particularly after the, the closure of the Jermy landfill site in, in 2024. Uh, sections 2.6 to uh, 2.8 then set out uh, a summary of the economic appraisal. Uh, the current projections are to say that it would be a capacity at Jermy in mid 2024, and a more environmentally responsible and economically sustainable approach is now required. Uh, and so, therefore, the, the economic appraisal has been developed, uh, which anticipates a, a total budget of uh, 2.329 uh, million pounds over uh, the, the, the next uh, two years to deliver or develop the waste transfer shed. And there is provision for that within the, the capital estimates. Uh, it's therefore recommended that uh, the project is approved as set out sorry, in, in section. 8, uh, 8.1 that members note the update and uh, 8.2 approve the business case in respect of the Jeremy Waste Transfer Station. Thank you, John. Um, I see Councillor Donald O'Coffey is the first to come in. Donald, um, I, I've been advised that if you're going to expand on the economic appraisal, which is available to us all in our resource library, uh, as this may be going out to tender, we would have to go into confidential if you're going to expand, particularly on that their topic, but on general topics around the paper, I think we can speak about it in this open part of the meeting. Is yeah, that okay, O'Donnell? Okay. Okay. I'm not going to be talking really about the, the economic appraisal. I think it's very professionally conducted and uh, makes a case within its own framework, but my questions is outside of that. So, um, Thank you, Donald. Basically, um, we're, we're looking at spending over £2.3 million on building storage, really, for uh, additional material to be incinerated. And that's the reality of what we're talking about here, uh, as opposed to dumped uh, in the ground. And uh, the last time this came before the Council, we had uh, raised the, the alternative, which is a zero waste policy, or at least attempts towards it. And I recognise one Council can't take all those steps on their own, but it does represent a fundamental failure that we are now looking at huge expenditure simply to store the waste that we will have to burn. Um, the, there are a lot of questions really around this. Uh, as far as I gather from the questions we've asked around incineration when we when I first become elected, and I'm sure other councillors have asked these, uh, the, the, currently we are burning wood waste, as far as I gather, we're not burning plastics is what we were told. So all the wood that could go to uh, incineration or energy recovery as some will call it uh is um is already been diverted uh but uh I, 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 you can only assume presume and uh, and certainly it's the information of the, the the economic appraisal that we will be now burning the plastics and and the, and the result of that dioxins and so on we're in a world where people are being told that they can't burn wood 
or, or uh, you know, uh, coal, but we are able to burn plastics. So there's a lot of questions of, about how uh, double standards, and we're we're asking ratepayers to stump up 2.3 million pound to pay for uh, a facility to simply to store all the waste that we're going to burn. How is that going to help? Uh, and by the way, that's only storing it for a few days, according to the economic appraisal. So you can imagine the volumes is involved that we're going to burn. How is that going to help global warming? How is that going to contribute to uh, zero, you know, a zero uh, waste economy when we know uh, when you start diverting to incineration, uh, the profit margin requires continued uh, input of waste. So I don't agree that this is, uh, as is stated here, um, uh, an economically or uh, a sustainable or environmentally responsible approach. Certainly not the latter. And I, I, I would not agree with this approach. I think we, we would instead be much better to try and develop a zero waste strategy to try and see what we can do on that. There, there are in instances when, for example, medical waste has to be incinerated. But why are we burning plastics? Why are we allowing this to happen and having to spend £2.3 million pound to do so? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Donald. And go back to yourself, John, on that. Uh, so, Chair, I would uh, just note the, the provision of the, the waste transfer station is so it's, it's dealing with the, the situation that, that we're facing at the minute. Uh, while I, I, I aspire to uh, zero waste and a completely circular economy model, uh, certainly that, that will be a journey. It's not something that will happen overnight. Uh, we have noted uh, within the paper that uh, we're, we are developing a, a waste transformation project, which will take account of some of those other additional policy and, uh, and strategic changes that we see coming down the track. Uh, however, uh, when Drumee landfill closes in uh, mid 2024, uh, you know we will still have the continual of a statutory obligation to manage waste. Uh, so we need to do something with it, uh, and you know it, it it won't just become zero waste at a point in time. So therefore, we need to have uh, the the resilience and the provision uh, to be able to manage the waste that we collect uh, over that period of time, and certainly after uh, Drumee closes, uh, it's likely that uh, you know what we're talking about will be fundamental behaviour changes uh, across uh, right across the district uh, for individuals communities, uh, businesses, uh, and that will take time. And the, the waste transfer station uh, will give us the resilience to be able to uh, develop those uh, behaviour change programmes and put in place additional measures uh, coming from the, the, the legislative and uh, strategic policy uh, changes that will then also impact and be reflected into uh, you know, changes to our, our service provisions and our service models in the years ahead. Thank you, John. Obviously, we we are major problems here in the, in something that we're going to have to do something about uh, in the medium ter term, so as we can do something. Uh, there's nobody else indicating to speak, and I'm wondering if we anybody who's going to propose and second the recommendations. And Councillor Robert Irvine's indicating in the chamber. Councillor Paul Robinson on WebEx. Okay. Uh, Donald, I'm, a, I'm not seeing anybody else indicating. On, uh, so we've heard the recommendations proposed and seconded. Donald, I take it you're dissenting? Dissent, Chair. Thank you. Is there anybody else would wish to record their dissent now before we come and move on? I'm taking that everybody else is uh, taking the view that whilst it isn't ideal, this is the only interim way that we can deal with this until we, a, a better solution is found. So uh, that taking us that item passed with Donald's dissent noted. And now we go on to item 5.5, .5, which is the director's report. I have uh, been indicated, uh, Adam Gannon had indicated he wished to bring, raise a matter onto any other business. However, Adam, this is going to be covered during this, uh, this report. So I'm going to bring you in at that stage. <coughs> so back to you again, John. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so uh, two parts to uh, the director's report uh, this evening. Uh, 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 parts one and two uh, relate to matters for decision and uh, parts uh, three to six relate to uh, matters for information. So if, if you don't mind, well, I'll maybe uh, focus in on uh, points one and two in, in the first instance. Uh, uh, <coughs> if we split those, I think, I think, judging by the indication, if you go with... Uh, the funding application for the chewing gum removal machine first and we'll yep. get it out of the way and then we'll so, go yep. to the next one after that about cottage lawn because i think there's going to be a debate about that one certainly sorry certainly sure yes that was uh, that was the intention yeah the, uh 2.1.1 sets out uh background uh to a, a funding application that officers have been developing uh to nilga uh for uh funding for a, a chewing gum removal uh machine uh uh, I'll not uh, go through the, the the detail of what's in what's in the paper, but suffice to say that uh, grants of up to twenty thousand pounds are available for individual councils uh, to fund street cleansing uh, uh, or equipment, uh, <coughs> with uh, larger grants of up to seventy thousand available for two or more councils working together. Uh, for Mananoma district council officers have uh, developed an application uh, for a chewing gum removal machine to help remove uh, chewing gum uh, from uh, streets. Uh, streetscape across the district. Uh, one of the criteria is that uh, the councils had to confirm, or applicants had to confirm that they had attained obtained approval from the relevant uh, committee. So to en enable to, en to, pardon me, to enable the application to be submitted on time, uh, certainly I had indicated approval as director, and uh, we had also indicated on the application that we would bring a, re a request for a retrospective approval to Environmental Services uh, Committee tonight, and uh, that's what's being asked for uh, in the, the recommendations at, at the end of, of this paper. Uh, 2.1.2 then is a request for uh, lighting at Cottage Lawn Bell Coo that was uh, that was previously considered. Sorry, John, I'll, I'll stop you there, John, and we'll we'll get that chewing gum out of the way. Uh, everybody's heard the report about the the chewing gum removal machine. It's it's a retrospective approval we're seeking from the council, and I have Councillor Mary Gardy is indicating in the chamber to propose that, and I'm looking for a seconder. Alan Rainey. Alan Rainey seconded that. Is there any dissenting from that? Derek, can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Donald. Yeah, it's just um uh, can I ask uh, what is the I see we're getting we're looking to get twenty thousand pound grant. Is that going to cover the total capital expenditure associated with this? And if not, where is the additional capital uh, contribution coming from in the budgets? And secondly, we have now outsourced, uh, unfortunately, the uh, imposition of fines. Um, uh, no, I, I, it remains to be seen how effective that's going to be. But will that have any? This is for littering and 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 the like. Uh, it will that have any impact on the the need for such an investment? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Donald. John, if you could cover that quickly. Uh, sure. I I don't have the uh, the the estimate, the full estimate of the cost. If there was any any shortfall. In the in the cost of the of the equipment that would be met from within existing uh, council budgets, uh, but I, I don't have them. If the councillor Coffey is happy, I, I, I come back to him tomorrow on the you know on the estimated of the pre, any pre tender uh, cost for the actual uh, piece of equipment. I just don't have that uh, to hand uh, this evening. But I'm say happy to come back to uh, councillor Coffey if that's if he's content with that. As in respect of the the question about will the uh, you know, will will the introduction of uh, uh, new uh, penalties uh, uh, scheme have any uh, any impact on the need for this equipment? I, I suspect that uh, it it won't. I suppose the int uh, the intention would be that uh, I suppose fines would would change people who are determined uh, to 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 throw litter down, to throw waste down, or to. Uh, uh, spit chewing them out onto the grounds, uh, but that won't have it won't have actually stopped them. The, the the penalties would only be after somebody has has if you want like uh, committed the act. Uh, so the chewing gum uh, removal machine will still be required to remove the chewing gum from the streetscape. Okay, thank you, John. Um, you've heard that the uh, the proposal has said uh, one point one part one funding application for the chewing gum removal machine proposed and seconded. Is there any dissent from that? 
No, so we can take that items out of the way. We'll now go on now to the request for lighting at College Lawn, Balcoo. So if you want to present that, please, John. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chair. So uh, members will recall this has been uh, through Environmental Services Committee uh, previously, uh, and there was a request that officers would e explore uh, the potential for the provision of lighting uh, within uh, within that area. So over the last uh, year, there has been uh, an environmental uh, study in, uh, undertaken. Uh, we've also considered the, uh, the request in terms of uh, the council's uh, what's now the, the biodiversity strategy that was uh, has, has just been approved. Uh, also, in the context of the uh, the work around uh, dark skies initiative uh, that was members uh, discussed in uh, November of uh, 2021, and the potential for accreditation uh, within the the, the geopark area, uh, we have uh, taken all of the, uh, these issues in, into consideration. Uh, alongside our obligations around uh, climate change and uh, the uh, estate strategy, uh, and on while acknowledging that there is uh, opinion within the within the locality that this would be uh, the provision of lighting would be uh, of benefit. Uh, uh, when we take into account all of the other uh, issues and the council's obligations around uh, pre-existing uh, strategies. Uh, the provision of lighting, uh, even with a on with the a lighting scheme that would seek to mitigate uh, biodiversity harm, uh, it's recommended that we don't proceed uh, with the scheme at this time. It's also noted that uh, within the report, uh, as part of the uh, sorry, as part of that environmental report, uh, we also got a, an indication of the type of scheme that would be required. And earlier this year, when we had uh, looked at some indicative costs for that scheme, it was likely to be in the region of 120,000, uh, which obviously doesn't take account of uh, more recent inflationary, inflationary pressures with ongoing uh, maintenance or revenue costs. Uh, there is no provision uh, for this uh, such a scheme within the, the current uh, capital uh, budget, the current uh, capital uh, program this year, uh, and nor has it been budgeted for in, in future years. And um, it's also then worth noting that uh, should a, a lighting scheme uh, proceed, it may be so, or will it would also be subject to a planning approval uh, down the line. So it's on, on that basis uh, that it's recommended the council doesn't uh, install any additional lighting at College Lawn Bell Coo. Okay, thank you, John. And I'm going to bring Adam Gannon in there first. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, my uh, opinion differs to the recommendation of the report. I'll be proposing that we do continue down uh, this path and we go um, through the process of creating a business uh, case for and potentially planning applications further down the line. Obviously, it'll have to come back to us uh, uh, multiple times for that. Um, firstly, I'll just uh, uh, later in this report, uh, the play park development, just want to welcome that Wednesday I'm on. I'll not come on again for that. And I have to thank John for taking me, me call earlier to today to discuss this. Um, I think there's concerns outlined in the report, but there's nothing insurmountable there, in, in my opinion. Um, even when you consider some of the concerns around, say, the Dark Skies Initiative, we're talking about small, low-level lighting, a small quantity of low-level lighting, just enough to safely see the path in your feet. And I would be recommending that it be on a timer, like many of the other lights that we have uh, in areas uh, such as, say, at um, the Round O there. Uh, the biodiversity points there, uh, I don't really agree with that. I think this has been done, lighting uh, that is back friendly has been done in many other areas across the world and there is lighting solutions which help protect the biodiversity whilst also uh, benefiting uh, the local community in those areas and I think we should uh, be doing that here. Um, John had mentioned that we may uh, need just to look at kind of legal advice uh, just to make sure it doesn't clash with any policies that we have and, and that would be fairly easily got. Uh, and in my proposal, obviously, I I'm going to propose that uh, that if John feels legal advice is required, that he that he seeks it, uh, and that if there is further considerations to come from that legal advice, that it be brought to us at uh, the July ES uh, meeting. And uh, hopefully, uh, I would like to imagine a business case to be completed for maybe September, October. Maybe I'm being optimistic there. Um, but I think uh, further to that, there, there's a point in about different community views. Now, uh, every person I speak to in Belcoo is very much in favour of this bar, uh, maybe one or two councillors. 
Um, uh, but I was chatting to community members uh, over the weekend and today, and they are more than happy to have a, a public meeting to discuss any concerns that there may be and to engage with the council. Previously, uh, there had been a petition for this uh, with over 500 signatures handed into the council, um, and that's a significant number of people in the Belle uh, area there. So I think there is massive uh, public support for this. And this is about uh, creating a safe space for people to exercise. It'll be brilliant for their physical and mental health and well-being. This is already in a, in a built up area, in an urban area, so it's not out uh, way out in the countryside here. And the last point I'll make, Chair, is around the finances. There are uh, opportunities for external funding. I believe uh, the shared island unit you know, could be uh, an excellent route to go down. It's underutilized at the minute. And considering uh, Belcoo and Black Lane and its cross border nature, and even GPs uh, across the border recommend. Uh, for people to go for a walk across the bridge and around the cottage uh, lawn as part of the, looking after their physical health. I definitely think uh, there's funding opportunities there. And again, this whole You're process will take time. Three there minutes there, Adam. No bother. Uh, just to say that there's lots of funding opportunities there. I would encourage uh, officers to explore them. And of course, there's reviews in the capital estimates throughout the years, which uh, would hopefully be worked in with funding. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor John Coyle has indicated on the chat that he is declaring an interest on the planning committee for any potential planning. Uh, I'm going straight here to the chamber and I'm going to continue the debate and we'll bring John in at the end. So, Councillor Anthony Feely. <coughs> Sorry, Anthony. Yeah, and, um, thank, um, I want to thank um, John for, for his report. Hello, um, I am very disappointed to see the rec recommendation as well. It seems to be the same old story, like finding more excuses to need the Highland Society Community Project for the people of Belcoo. And I say that as a councillor and as somebody who only lives up the road from me in Garrison, you know. And I don't, I don't think the report has actually outlined the community demand for that, to suggest that there is very opinion, despite very limited contact with the community, having been carried out. So I would seriously challenge that, talking to people on the ground there as well, and the amount of lobbying that I've been got getting on this for this last few years, I'd say it would be 80% for and maybe 20% again, so 70, 30, and it's very outmost. And before my time, Barry Doherty and Stephen Hoggart was getting lobbied on as well, so I'd, I, I'd find that hard to, to, to see, see being right, you know. The, the report also does not state that there is minimum ways to provide the lighting with a very, very limited potential impact. I would point out that, that there is lighting already on the, on the main cycle right beside it, so this, this, this is no good for the residents to, to use when they walk around the meadows just down, down the bottom end. You know, it's all right beside the road they're walking, it's just down the bottom end, which is where we do need the lights, you know. And there's no other facility in, for recreation for anybody in that area, young, old, middle-aged, anybody for go for a walk or anything. So. The lack of a light around the cottage middle means that residents can only avail of this wonderful site in the in the summer months and in the dark winter that it's no good them at all for walking or running and there is a, a local running group in the area so it, it, it does meet all the criteria that we have outlined in our council community plan or it does encourage people for health recreation well-being and exercise activities in Bilicu. so do, doing that would be an easy option for, for the council but I, I think that we should um, c c continue on with this for, for the reason I've said ab above there, and um, and as it goes for, it says you know the responsibility of the council has hasn't got an obligation to, to lay grounds, but in the broad meadow and in the skill here, there's lights in it, and I think there's lights in in um, distant ski as well, and some of the parks up there, you know. So the people in Belcoo, this is this isn't just my view, it's that the people in Belcoo who say that they um. They feel discriminated, discriminated as rural residents. You know that it's just because there's not as many people using it as would be using it in the bigger towns. Like, that they're being left out, and they're very annoyed about it. You know, so that's another reason why we, we'd have to try and do more than we have done. You know, so I would, um, I could second um, Councillor Gann's um, proposal, or I could make a proposal of my own. You know, that um, that the uh, that we um, look, look for, and I'm looking for support for all the councillors here tonight too for this proposal. A seek a way to increase the the health of the people in in in, in the in go get a. Um, what I'm trying to say is we should um, send out a uh, kind of like a have a public meeting or or else just get um, responses from everybody. A consult. Uh, 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 what well, I don't know what to do, but we have to do more to get the people behind us, you know, and 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 and, and second Adam's proposal, rather than make a proposal to me on, do we have a meeting or we'll um, get um, just um, like a big um, petition or get, do something else in here? 
the more than this. That's going to be frozen. Thank you. That's dead on three minutes. Uh, going now to Webex again, Councillor Victor Warrington. <coughs> Sorry, Chair, my hand's not up on this item. It's up on an item further on in the, the paper. Okay, then I'm going to Councillor Chris McCaffrey in the Chamber. Thank you, Carly. Thank you, Chair. And I just want to second the proposal made by my colleague, Councillor Anthony Feely. And I've been in agreement with what has been said by the um, councillor so far. I want to thank John for the report. And I know he's struggling there at home with uh, COVID. So we appreciate you um, logging on to the meeting tonight to give us that report. It's not easy. But I do find the recommendation extremely disappointing that nothing would be done about the Cottage Meadow in Belcou. I know firsthand the massive demand that there is for the provision of lighting to enable residents to use this wonderful facility, this wonderful resource all year round. As already outlined, there are no other walking uh, or running facilities in the Belcoo area. All the community leaders in the area that I'm aware of, the Belcoo Rahalis GEA Club, Belcoo Running Club, local business people, and certainly, certainly as a councillor for Erin West and someone who lives in Belcoo, um, the residents of the area all strongly feel this lighting would bring enormous benefit to the community and would increase their well-being and allow all year round opportunities for recreation and health activities. And as we all know, this is sorely needed in all communities. I obviously note the need for us to be very conscious of the environment and everything that we do as a council body, and that should be a consideration with everything. Though I would point out the contradiction that it is OK to light up urban areas, as mentioned, like in Inniskillen and Lisnaski, yet discourage this in more rural uh, settings. <coughs> this is a very unfair way to treat the people in the Belcoo area who want to live and be active in their own community. It is important to say that this is a light touch appraisal, a light touch report, yet it already has been outlined that there is a way to provide the lighting which would have a minimal effect on the bio biodiversity and nature around the cottage meadow. I want to see this project given the proper consideration. The community should have proper input into an evalu evaluation and we as a council should be encouraging ways for communities to be more involved in well-being, health and recreation activities. The light, the, the um, options could be looked at for a partnership approach to funding this project. Um, none of these supposed issues are insurmountable, in my opinion. It's a great project that would pay an enormous dividend to the community and would certainly be a positive project for the council to be involved in. Um, I know Councillor Gannon did mention around um, minimal lighting in other places which uh, where there are bat life. Uh, as a former employee of the Marble Arch Caves Global Geopark, where there's lighting in the cave, uh, where there are bats, and now that we are doing tours all year round, that lighting is all on all year round. So we do already light up areas where there are bat um, and another uh, nature. So I think that um, it's a bit of a contradiction to state that in one report we can't do it, but we are already doing it in other areas. So just to um, endorse and support what has already been said, but also to really make the case to make the to support the proposal that my council colleague Anthony Feely made for a full community evaluation and to proceed with this, to proceed with the business case, to proceed with finding a way to increase health and well-being in the Belcoo area. And I think that's through this project. So I'll just leave it there, Chair. Go Thank you, Chris. I'm going now to Councillor Donald Coffey on Webex. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I have to say the the uh, the justification of not doing this that it would cost too much money is not something that I think is really a, a positive point. However, um, as someone, uh, I walk this every night pretty much. Uh, this uh, three times I walk it every night is a, a habit I have. If I don't, my wife walks it. And uh, uh, when I'm out, I hardly ever, and I, I'm talking about the middle of the winter, you'll meet people out there as well. And um, so it, to say it, it is off limits of people is complete nonsense. In fact, I would say that the fact that you can actually see the Milky Way, uh, as a, someone who lives in a council house, I can walk to the end of my street across to a publicly owned park and go around the corner of it and you can see the Milky Way, the Orion uh, constellation with all its historic and cultural significance for us. Um, and and that is what I, pre I find really important. Actually, it's one of the most important things in uh, not just for me, but many people I know. And um, I think that the, the night is something that we are losing in our country. Uh, we're losing a touch with something that goes back thousands of years. 
in terms of our culture, um, the connection with the stars and so on, and the fact that this exists for people uh, who don't have houses in the countryside who uh, can do that in our area, that there's a potential potentially for tourism to be developed on the back of this. And another thing I see when I walk out there is the quick motion. I only catch it and tangentially of the bats as they fly over your heads, the nature being out in it. And that's something for me, I, I think we need to defend. Now, I do recognize there's a large number of people and they are very keen to have lights installed. They're runners. They're not walking it, they're running it uh, and they want to do it and they feel that it's unsafe at the moment. They don't have anywhere to run. I understand that entirely. Um, they want to run on the, on the cottage meadow. Unfortunately, I don't see how you can reconcile uh, those of us who wish to have a, a commune with nature or the sky and those who want to run uh, because, frankly, I don't know how you could have low intensity lighting that would not affect bats, that would actually leave a, the brown path, that, a black path that we have safe for anyone to run on it because you'd be running in the night in something that's poorly lit. So I don't know if there's any thoughts around that. Um, there is obviously the GA pitch uh, and the circuit that people do run around there. I don't know if that's a solution. I don't have any answers, but I, for me uh, and for those I speak to, and I do speak to people on both sides, but I know that there's a considerable number of people here in Belku who value the fact that you can see the Milky Way, Orion, uh, the moon, and so many other things in really quality dark light. And you can also have the bats and whatever else, the birds singing around you. That would all go uh, if you have the wrong side type of lighting. And you, I do have Finish a black there, light. Please don't last three minutes. On, the football pitch across the lake is actually, uh, you're going to see the lights shining across and it ruins everything out that. So that's where I'm coming from. On Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Donald. And now we go to Councillor Paul Blake on WebEx. Thanks, uh, Chair. Thanks for letting me in. Uh, thanks, John, also for the report and wish you well in your recovery from COVID as well. Um, like some of my fellow colleagues there, I would be very much opposed to the, what's being recommended in that report. Uh, I was lobbied heavily. I used to work down there in the Customs House and I've been lobbied heavily only a matter of weeks ago, actually, during the Assembly election by people down there that that do use that area and would be very much in favour of some form of lighting for it, especially for as we get into the winter months, because it is encouraging a more healthy and active lifestyle. It's also a safe area for kids to play in. So I, I, I'd be surprised if we can't find some form of discrete lighting that is very much encouraging biodiversity and the, the wildlife that's down in that area, but also encourages the people that live in the area that can uh, avail of a, what is a beautiful area, the Cottage Meadow, to have a healthy and active lifestyle all at the same time. So there has to be a way to achieve that, and that's why I'm hoping um, to support my fellow councillors that, that want to see lighting in the Cottage Meadow. Thanks for that. Thank you, Paul. And we go to Councillor Bert Wilson. Uh, yes, Chair. Well, I, I would give my support to the proposal uh, by Councillor Gannon and Councillor Feely. I have raised it previously to do with uh, uh, Abbey uh, Street and Abbey uh, Church Street in Fintna. And I, I'm not going to make a speech, but I just uh, want to give uh, lend the support at, uh, for other areas as well. And the local people there feel unsafe. Uh, the lights were already in place and were removed, so I would ask that uh, we, I, I lend my support to the the two councillors and ask that uh, the one in Fintna be replaced. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. And with Councillor Tommy Maguire. Uh, Gora Margaret Kearley, and uh, I wasn't going to join the debate, but uh, I feel I, I also need to, to join with my colleagues and indeed other councillors. I too, in Inniskillen, have been lobbied quite heavily by the uh, residents of Belcoo, walkers and runners alike. And uh, I, I'm at a, a loss to think that we can't, as a local council, come up with some option that will still allow Councillor Coffey to see the Milky Way and allow the, the walkers and runners to see their feet on the path. So uh, I just want to add my support. And uh, I'm sure that uh, with a, a due diligence, we may come up with a resolution to this issue. Good Margaret Carley. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McGuire. Uh, <laughs> Councillor McCaffrey, you're indicating to come back in again. You had about 15 seconds left of your three minutes, so make it quick. Thank you, Chair. I will be quick. 
I just want to say that with, in terms of what Councillor Coffey said, we can't deal in anecdotes. What are the facts? We know what the facts are. There are no other facilities in the area, apart from the football pitch, which is lit up for training and matches. I'm not sure if Councillor Coffey has a pair of football boots he brings up to the pitch there. It's also lit up beside Loch McNeen. It's in the same uh, vicinity, the same area as where we're talking about the cottage grounds. We are wanting to reduce carbon and become a net zero carbon um, uh, emitter in the council district. Well. What is the point then of not allowing facilities in rural areas, forcing people to drive away from rural areas into Enniskillen or into other places, putting cars onto the road, burning fuel? This is all counterproductive in what we're trying to do. And as I stated before, even in the chamber tonight, we have um, many councillors are actually in favour of this. That shows that the lobbying is certainly in favour uh, of this project. One councillor against, I don't know how many other councillors have spoken. Finish up there, please. Just, just to state that I think without a proper community evaluation, there's no way of knowing what the um, projected demand for the project is. But certainly tonight, the facts would seem, seem to speak for themselves. So I'll leave it there. Gurr Mogget. Thank you, Chris. Before I uh, take those recommendations, John, uh, can do you want to come back in before we look at the recommendations? Uh, so thank you, Chair. Sure. I, I suppose they just a couple of things, and I, I, I may be just I am restating maybe things that are in the in the paper, but I, I do just feel that it is important that that, that we restate them. One is that the, the proposal to light uh, college lawn, you know, is likely to be contrary to the, the geopark management plan and the, the council's biodiversity strategy and indeed wider climate change obligations, uh, and it's, uh, it will impact adversely on the potential for dark skies accreditation, and that's what I think we've said. We, we may need to to, to seek uh, some uh, some legal advice uh, in that regard. Uh, with regard to the, the finance issue, it it is simply one of the the considerations that uh, informed the the recommendation. Uh, and I do just need to, to restate that there, there isn't any financial provision in the, the five-year capital plan for the project, and should members wish to proceed uh, subject to any uh, legal advice uh, on a proposal, then we would need to review the capital plan to see where existing projects could be uh, possibly uh, removed to support uh, this project coming forward. And that will all obviously be subject to the, the, the normal uh, council, uh, council procedures, as, as all members have already referred to, such as uh, preparation of a business case, uh, which would look at finances and and also uh, a planning application uh, 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 in due course if that was the, the recommendation coming out of a, out of any business case. Thank you, John. So we have, we have two proposals. One one which is partners. The set of the first one. The first one is from Councillor Adam Gannon, seconded by Councillor Anthony Feely, is that the officers bring forward a business case and look at how we can mitigate against the uh, the changes to council policy and to uh, contact the uh, shared island to see if, they, if it's something they could fund. Is that correct, Adam? Uh, yes, that and any other uh, funding uh, bodies that the council officers feels appropriate. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Anthony, you're coming in there. And then I was going to just say, Anthony, your proposal was, and I think from what Chris had said and what you had said, you're looking some sort of uh, community survey evaluation or consultation to take place. Sorry, I'm going to need to turn you on. Community evaluation, the way to increase well-being and health activities in Belcoo, there has to be a community evaluation in, in it. Okay, thank you. So, the first proposal, is there any dissent on that? Yes, Councillor Robert Irvine. Uh, Victor, is that a dissent? If we're going to have to go to the vote here, I'm going to abstain from voting, but I'll continue to chair the meeting. So, uh, no, no, Chair, my hand's still up for... Uh, okay, sorry, vote, thank you, Victor. So, it's just Robert. Um, who's dissenting at this stage? And on uh, on Anthony's, is there any dissent proposal? Uh, is to undertake a community evaluation and survey uh, to take into account the, the the well-being of the community and the use of the village green. And I'm not seeing any dissent on that. Bert, you're indicating there. 
Uh, yes, Chair. What I I I did, was not uh, in support of uh, an All Ireland view uh, across border. Sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Bart. Thank you. So we'll take it that uh, that we're going against the officer's recommendations and the proposals from Councillor Gannon and Councillor Philly have passed. So, John, we'll go on then with the matters for information if you want to run through those now quickly. Thank uh, you. So, Chair, can I, just, just for the record, just note, and I think there was, there was two other dissents noted in the chat there from Councillor Coffey and, and Councillor Armstrong, uh, just uh, so they're noted. But uh, so I, that's why I'll, I'll uh, move on to those other items that uh, you talked about. So, uh, within the, the, the rest of the report, uh, matters set out for information uh, 2.2.1, it relates to information on uh, welfare facility improvements uh, at uh, household recycling uh, centres over the course of the next uh, uh, three months uh, and some closures that may be required. 2.2.2. Uh, is uh, picking up on a matter arising from the last meeting, and Councillor Irvine's already alluded to this, that was uh, information on uh, forest areas uh, within the district that the council manages to a uh, memorandum of understanding with uh, Forest Service Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, 2.2.3 sets out, it's a, a standing uh, report that comes, it's always quarterly in arrears, and it's on the collected municipal waste management statistics uh, for the district and for Northern Ireland in the period October to December. Uh, 2021. <coughs> Pardon me. And then uh, moving on down, uh, 2.2.4 is an update on play park strategy uh, for year one. Uh, a lot of the information in that regard was uh, previously uh, provided to members in uh, a recent workshop, uh, but also sets out just a, 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 an update on where we are in terms of the award of contracts uh, for year one and consultations that have now been completed. Uh, for year two. So uh, th those other points are really uh, for information. Okay, thank you, John. Those items are all for information. And Councillor Victor Warrington, you're the first to indicate. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I was just on the on the on the listener ski on the on the amenities, the, the refuge amenities and listener ski. Obviously, uh, it's noted that they are going to be closed for approximately six months. Now, listener ski, obviously, as we all know, is a very is, is a big town with with uh, uh, where there's a lot of people would um, use that use that site. Um, six months, obviously, to send. The people of Listener Ski, two other uh, amenity sites, Newton Butler, um, Enniskillen, wherever else they are, Tempo. Um, uh, I think it's going to be very unfair on them to a degree. As the council, how much has the council looked in to how this is going to affect people in the area? Because it doesn't suit everybody, obviously, to have to travel to another uh, amenity site. Uh, so, what is the what is the thinking there? Thank you. Thank you, Victor. John, do you want to come in there on that? Correct. Yeah. Uh, how, yeah. The uh, I mean, they are significant uh, redevelops that we're proposing for Listener Ski, and I suppose that recognises the importance of the of the site as a household recycling centre within the district. Uh, the given the nature of the uh, of the works that, that are required or the extent of the works that are required. Uh, so that's why the closure is required for that period of time, and uh, a lot of the closure period is is, is often to do with uh, uh, curing time for concrete, uh, as well as the, the works that are actually happening on site. Uh, but what I would say is that, as we noted in the report, that the project will be a significant upgrade of facilities to increase uh, capacity for recyclable materials and its separation uh, in the, the the HR in the HRC. Uh, and also help us to decrease the amount of, of waste that's going into in the landfill. Uh, we are uh, continuing to work through the, uh, the, the tender process and, and more detailed information on the closure uh, period. We'd hope to bring that to the July Environment and Services uh, Committee meeting. And alongside that, we'll also be able to provide more detail on the uh, alternative signposting arrangements and any other mitigations that will be, be put in place during the period of the closure. Thank you, John. Uh, Councillor Donald Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, in regard to, uh, I see uh, we're now looking at the removal, uh, sorry, the transformation um, 
of the play park in Lockview Drive in Belcoo. That's the one in the middle of the housing estates. Um, I, I, I have obviously expressed my opposition to this previously, but um, I still don't think most people uh, realize what's going to happen. And I imagine that there may be some feedback from that. Uh, one of the no things uh, I think it was said during the whole process was that there's a kind of a generational change process whereby parks can be used because of this simple higher proportions and numbers of young people li living in estates and that then they go out of use and then they come back into use and this 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 process and i actually believe we're already seeing that in regard to certainly lockview drive uh, i for years i hadn't seen any children on it for a long time and now every time i look there's at least three kids on it so um I'm very conscious that with the removal of that, children uh, aged three, four, five are going to be requested, uh, required to walk all the way down to the corner where the um, the former barracks was. Now it's uh, Mackening Court, and to cross the road there using the uh, safe crossing. Hopefully, they won't cross the road in, in the unsafe place across the A4. Uh, to go to where the tourist amenity facility is going to be. And I really don't think that that's safe or appropriate uh, when we're talking about children of that age. Now, maybe people will think, uh, well, parents to take them out and all that, and that's maybe right and wrong, I don't know. But uh, a lot of the time, I don't think children are accompanied, and there's a lot of pressures on families, we all know. I'm not convinced at all that there's uh, this removal of this is actually safe. I think it's deeply discriminatory against uh, the working class part of the village, uh, which is the uh, housing estates. And um, I, I think that uh, it is wrong. So I want to signal my dissent on this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Councillor Robert Irvine in the chamber. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, it's just to catch up what Councillor Warrington was saying, Victor, with regard to the redevelopment of Listen Ski. Look, I, I welcome this um, to actually upgrade, process, and expand the operation as good so we can actually um, segregate and travel through or waste all the better. The problem that I see, and Victor was trying to hint to it, is that the alternatives available to the residents of Lisnesky uh, are going to be pointed towards uh, Newton Butler, Tempo, Lisbelow, and Inniskillen. In all reality, they are going to choose the closest one. Inniskillen is going to be the one that's least used unless there's a huge amount of uh, waste coming in. And all that I'm asking, John, is that additional resource is actually sent are targeted into those uh, recycling centres over that period of redevelopment. Otherwise, they are going to get swamped because whilst a certain amount will go into Inniskillen, a lot of it will come to the peripheral ones and they will just start to be overwhelmed, particularly coming into the busy period over the summer. So if resource could be transferred over to those, it would be appreciated by the operatives in those areas. Thanks very much. Thank you, Robert. John, I'm not going to bring you in just yet. I've just two more councillors indicating, and then I'll let you summarize, summarize for everybody. So, Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly on WebEx. Thank you, Chair. And I just wanted to come in in relation to item six, the Play Park Strategy update. And I just wanted to thank officers for all the work they've done to date in relation to the Play Park Strategy, working to, to the plan and the schedule in terms of the projects from year one and year two. And they're making excellent progress to date. And certainly in my area, there's been very positive engagement with the officers and with great community engagement. So I think they've done an excellent job today. So I just wanted to commend their efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And come back to Councillor Anthony Feely in the chamber. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I just come in brief on two, on two topics there, 2.2.1 about the recycling centres. And I'm glad to see there's going to be a bit of work done in, in Garrison. Um, in, in my own village, I was just wondering what what were they doing there? You know what what kind of work were they doing? And I brought this up before. Maybe I might have to do it myself again with road service. And I asked to get a, a sign up outside it. And I wonder could the council maybe look for it too and make get it done better a wee bit quick. You know, it's just it's on a fast bit of a road there. You're coming from Belcoo and the cars cars has been booting down. You know, and 
people to reverse in and that. I know the fellow that works there has put a wee saying up every morning, he walks up the road and puts a saying up from Belcoo, but if we could have a, a rate saying there for people to slow down or else to say to entrance and coming up from the village, which was just one that maybe the council could lobby on it as well as well as myself. So I'm I'm just glad that there's been work done on it. And on two point two one at the at the or two point two four at the about the player parks as well. Much the same as Don. I was just coming in on that as well and I see the the we um park in Melvin Park is going to be transformed into a green area as well. You know and I, I have no real problem with it because I know it's it's the same as as some other issues, some for, some against, against it, because I did go around Melbourne Park asking people about it, and not too bad. But I was just wondering, was the people in the houses told that this is going, going to be done? Have, have they been notified in the two houses in Belcoo and Garrison? And what kind of response did you get for the, from them? I know a few in Belcoo is for and against. I was just wondering, do they, have you, as a council, notified them and told them it's going to be done? Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. John, if you want to come in now and answer it, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, first of all, in terms of the, and I just noted the, the, the various comments from, from members and, you know, particularly the, the, the comments about list the ski and uh, the, the need for that sort of uh, resilience planning at, at other uh, household recycling centres during the period of that closure. And that is absolutely, that, that, is, that is part of our, our contingency planning uh, during the period of the closure. And it is one of the things that we had, uh, you know, taken into account in looking at the the other uh, upgrade works at, at uh, you know, some of the the, the nearby or neighbouring uh, HRCs to make sure that those works are, are completed and out of the way so that the, those sites are available uh, when the list of ski uh, would be shut. And, uh, we, you know, we'll, we will uh, take on take on board uh, comments about uh, resourcing and need to make sure that uh, those household recycling centres are uh, able to deal with any additional uh, uh, demand uh, that's placed on the services or uh, in respect of uh, I suppose the the, uh, the the play or sorry the the specific comment then about the uh, uh, the the household recycling centre at Garrison certainly if uh, Council Party is content uh, we can t I can take a look at, at that with officers as to the nature of the signage and whether that's us having to make representations to DFI or whether there's anything that that council can do uh, certainly uh, take that uh, uh, that that, that uh, comment on board uh, and then I suppose finally just the, the general comment a number of uh, members have comment about the uh, play parks and about the uh, the planned upgrade works and part of that is the transformation I suppose uh, what we're uh, proposing in, uh, in in year one and be the it has formed also the the the, the basis of the consultations that have taken place for year two is that uh, there has been uh, extensive uh, community consultation that has been both uh, in person meetings uh, within uh, the the areas. Uh, Either the areas affected or uh, sort of adjacent to the play parks and also uh, online consultations. I suppose I mean there has been a, a probably a, a much stronger uh, participation in the in, in the online uh, consultations uh, as one might expect. It's a more convenient uh, forum for many people. Uh, but yes, I mean we have been we have experienced certainly what transformation means and that's about creating uh, green spaces and again that's very much creating green spaces uh, that will uh, it's, it, it's opportunities for if we, if we talk about passive play and uh, you know uh, play board talk about the importance of, of passive play for younger age groups as well in terms of uh, development uh, but it's also the uh, transformations that will be consistent with our climate change obligations and uh, also biodiversity uh, commitments around uh, encouraging uh, biodiversity uh, within uh, local uh, within local areas and within those green spaces thank you john um I'm looking somebody to propose and second the uh, matters for information. And I see Councillor Thomas O'Reilly, you're looking to come in and speak. Yes, Chair, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to propose, uh, Chair, uh, but I'd like to uh, just tease out a little bit more on the idea of the six months. I appreciate John said uh, to allow cement to cure. I have never yet heard of cement that takes six months to cure. So uh, I find that a little bit uh, incredulous that he wants us to swallow that one as a as a way to justify six months of a closure. Uh, so I'd be interested um, as to you know what exactly the construction uh, time scale is there and what is getting done that requires six months because 
as Robert has indicated there, certainly uh, a very busy recycling centre such as Listen Ski, the, the uh, fallout of that is going to go to the likes of Newton Butler, which is already a very busy uh, and undeveloped, I might say, uh, recycling centre where if the gates are closed more than a day, it's piled up outside it. And we certainly don't want that on a continuous six months basis. So the uh, call for extra resource in there, I think is very much uh, needed uh, to be able to have a quicker turnaround for pickups and not allow things to build up to overflow capacity. And certainly the opening hours uh, that won't coincide with what people are used to in listener ski will maybe uh, have people arriving when the place is closed and then not wanting to take the stuff back with them and leaving it there. So uh, as happens uh, from time to time, so very interested to get some sort of a comment around that first. Uh, and the other uh, issue chair was uh, health and safety uh, when we're talking about play parks and the redevelopment. And I note the, the work that's ongoing but in Newton Butler, the vehicular access to the play park, which is a, a fairly health and safety uh, barrier that is there, is bent and lying open. And I'm just wondering when that's going to be fixed. And the other one, Chair, is that there was a, a piece of equipment, and we don't have that many pieces of equipment, that was old and got broken. I see it taken out completely now and a piece of soft play put in, which doesn't uh entice me to believe that there is going to be a replacement piece of equipment uh put in very soon so i'd like to if john doesn't obviously probably have that to hand uh if somebody could come back to me on those points chair thank you thomas i'm are you coming in the second yes chair thank you and uh, we'll go back to john for a quick reply to thomas there uh, th thank you, Chair. And so I, I would just uh, want to maybe uh, clarify with uh, with members. I, I wasn't suggesting it was taking concrete six months to cure. So I, I didn't mean if I, if I gave that impression that wasn't the intention. But the the, the, the six months uh, time scale uh, is reflective of the extent of the works uh, that will be required at the site uh, as part of the the I suppose the, the project plan development process. We did give consideration to uh, looking at, at partial closure of the site, uh, and but on health and safety grounds, uh, you know, we, we had we had ruled that out just because of the the risks that would arise from having contractors and and heavy machinery on site and the public on site at the same time. We felt that was an unacceptable risk. So the the the, the six months uh, time frame is indicative. Uh, we, as, as we said, there, I mean, we still have to go to uh, the, the construction and build tender. And when we get that full pack back, uh, we'll have more more precise detail on the exact time frame. So the, the six months was was indicative that it could be up to six months. Uh, and certainly that <coughs> be happy to bring, you know, a more deep, you know, to bring that detail when we have it. Uh, to the hopefully it would be, be uh, pardon me hopefully we will have that for the July meeting but certainly hope you know happy to bring that uh, the detail of, of how the six months of the the, uh, the project timelines uh, are coming about to the to that next meeting on the on the specifics uh, about Newton Butler Play Park uh, Councillor I mean it's I, I, I apologize I, I don't have the, the specifics as you said to hand but I, I will uh, follow up with the the play team uh, uh, in that regard tomorrow. Uh, and happy to come back to you uh, uh, tomorrow or, or Friday if, if you're content with that. Thank you very much, John. Okay. Thank you, John. You've heard the uh, inform uh, matters for information proposed by Thomas and seconded by Anne Marie, <coughs> Councillor Anne Marie. Only, uh, I think there's no dissent from that, so we'll take that as passed. That's item 5.5 .5 completed, and now we go on to agenda item 6.1, street naming num numbering, and we go to uh, Director John Boyle for this. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, members will remember that last month we did, we discussed part of this report, uh, and we decided, members decided that it would be deferred for a month, so the costings in relation to the specific uh, naming of Ross Noreen Road and Thrillick uh, could be made available uh, to members. Um, the, 
just in relation, and, and there are a number of things which have arose, arisen in that intervening month, one, one mainly in relation to the naming itself. Um, but uh, members will, will remember that in that the, the conditions in relation to our policy were met, uh, where 15% or greater than 15% of the occupiers in the street indicated that they were in favour of the erection of signage. Uh, there was the report last month um, proposed Bahar Rosna Rian. Um, as as the road name, uh, following that meeting, uh, a representative of the, of the local community offered an alternative translation, um, which is better known in the local community, and it's a very slight change of Bahar Nos Rosna Rian, um, and you'll notice that the, the spelling of of the word Rian. Uh, we have um, gone to our. Um, language expert who confirms the road names and he has agreed that this could be an alternative spelling and um, so we are proposing uh, that that the the irish naming is is changed to bahar ross Noreen as as is in um 2.1 of of the report in relation to the cost of uh, of the particular signage the the capital cost for the supply and installation uh, has been recently revised to, to four hundred pounds per sign, and that is due to a, a recent increase in, in the tender supply price, and also an increase or an expected increase in, in the installation price. Um, with regard to this development, that there are fourteen signs which are required, which would come in with an approximate capital cost of supply and installation of five thousand six hundred pounds. Um, and as reported last month, the average cost of an application in relation to staff time. Uh, is somewhere in the region of £925. So therefore, the, t the total cost of this uh, particular um, application would be somewhere in the region of £6,600. Um, we have, just to, to make it very clear to the Council, uh, we have a capital budget allocated in our estimates process for £200,000, which was approved uh, as part of the estimates process for the provision of dual language signage. And, and that was on the basis of the number of applications which we had awaiting the, the outcome of our revised policy. And, and just going on to, to update on as to where we are in relation to the, the, the signage requests, uh, we, we have received, uh, since the, the policy was approved, uh, we have received a, a list of over 250 applications uh, for dual language signage. Um, there, there, there has been a delay with the electoral office, but I have to say in, in the recent number of weeks, uh, discussions with the electoral office have proved uh, very productive. Um, in that the, they have now made the full register available to officers who visit the electoral office, um, and therefore that speeds up the inspection process. Uh, they've also agreed to, to give us full days, or at least from 10 o'clock in the morning till 3.30 in the afternoon. So instead of half-hour slots, which we were previously uh, we previously got with the electoral office, we are now allowed full days, which allows a lot better use of staff time when they go up to Belfast and, and view the electoral register. In light of that, we have, at this point in time, um, secured resident details for over 50 of those 250 uh, outstanding applications. Uh, I know we we have officers going up again tomorrow, so that and and that will continue until we have the full two hundred and fifty applications assessed with the electoral office. That is just the start of the process, though, because it does then making sure to to, to send out uh, the various documentation and the assessment of that documentation and 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 so on and so forth. Um, so therefore, uh, chair the the. Recommendation is that the council approves the dual language signage for signage for Ross Noreen Road Trillic in accordance with the street name and a number and policy, and also notes the update on the dual language signage request. Thank you for that report, John. And uh, first of all, we have Councillor Mary Garty indicating in the chamber. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, and thank you, John, for um, this report. I think I also want to thank the members who last month agreed to defer a month on this item. I think it is proved valuable as information that we're getting from yourself um, as, as a director and more information which we wanted. I'm still of the same 
mindframe um, and happy to propose the recommendations outlined in point one and two of point eight of the report and I do welcome this. Um, I do know there's a long road ahead with this and we will be having to keep a watch and brief on it but at this stage this is within uh, the budget allocated and I certainly welcome it for the, for the trillic of people who are excited about this going forward and uh, I just want to propose the recommendations as outlined here. I know we had a good discussion this last month, and indeed there may be more tonight, but I realise you're conscious of time, so I'll just keep it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'm going to go to Councillor Donalo Coffey on WebEx. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I, I want to focus on this issue of uh, Ross Narina or Ross Narine. Um it's it's genuinely quite concerning uh that from what i every everything you read here uh, basically an independent translator that we usually use to produce translations came up with a, a translation which was uh judged to be inaccurate um by the local community if that's the case the question arises how many other uh similar translations are inaccurate on the other hand is it inaccurate um ross Noreen, I, I well you could have your own thinking about these things but uh it really depends uh the study of and the tra the meaning of uh, and the etymology of townland names is a hugely complex subject unfortunately um 10 percent of townlands we simply don't know what they mean at all the the, the this is the problem uh that sometimes it is almost worse to attempt to translate because you end up concretizing something that may be wrong and if we if it was to be uh, if, if it is correct ross Narian, as opposed to ross Narina, uh then we if we had had it adopted ross Narina, then we would have compromised um quite an important cultural inheritance um and i think that's the 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 fear, uh, I've seen it so many times uh, as someone who's a great interest in this issue, that we mistranslate or misinterpret, uh, and especially uh, people coming from uh, areas where different forms of Irish are spoken, uh, slightly different pronunciations, different vocabularies, they tend to pick different translations. And I, I at the same time, we it seems from what we're saying here that uh, somebody from the local community came up with an alternative um, and that this was it may be judged to be correct and that's what we're going with so I, I just think the whole thing is quite problematic and I would like personally to see much more research into what is the correct name is there a history for example of some queen being associated with a wood here is there maybe a, a flight of people that has occurred in history along this route because that would certainly explain Ross Narian. But um, I think we need to learn a lot more about these things before we jump in. And, and it can do a lot of damage with the right best intentions. And that's what I'm fearful of. So I'm just, I, 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 I'm not happy to uh, agree to this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Donald. I'm going to go to Councillor Chris McCaffrey in the Chamber. Gormogat, Akahali. And well, as everyone will be aware, I have a huge interest in this item. Um, I do want to just, uh, one question I would just ask before um, I proceed to talk about the, the issue at hand, but um, maybe would, would John agree that um, since the introduction of the policy, there has been a substantial demand and increase um, in the request for Irish language signage and dual language signage? Yes, Chair, I think I've, I've noted in the report there that since the, since the policy was adopted, we have received over 250 applications. You will note from the report also that prior to that, I think there were 14 applications which had been received and which had been approved, 24, sorry, uh, that had been approved. So that gives you an indication of, of, the, of the interest that is in it. Well, that's all very good. I read the report, just wanted to get that uh, on the record. So it's obviously the policy is uh, working and is, uh, our communities are engaging with it. So um, I do agree with Councillor O'Coffey um, in regards to the difficulties around um, translating or in this case, going back to the original naming of um, some of the townlands and uh, road names and, and various other things, um, you know, it can be extremely difficult. There's lots of reasons for that. You know, the Irish language was unfortunately not allowed to be written down for a number of centuries due to penal laws and different things. Um, there are 
some differences in the various dialects of the Irish language and um, you know each community um, also would have had perhaps their own vernacular and their own um, dialect at times but you know I, I think we can work out a way um, to accurately uh, translate um, the names an independent translator can perhaps link in better with local historians and local people from each community as as if, if an issue arises um you know to my knowledge a lot of the a lot of them are straightforward enough um there will of course be from time to time um difficulties and that's why translation is such a uh, detailed and precise um subject so i think you know we possibly can work out a framework way of dealing with these issues as they arise um if the community of Trillic is, is happy with that translation of Boha Ross Narain, um, which to me makes more sense, I can see, look, I can see the difference, um, the reason why the you know Ross Narina would not work. Um, I'm not sure why it would pertain to the, the Queen. Um, you know, Ross, Ross Narain, the headland, um, one of the tracks makes more sense to me. So I can see um, the issue that was there. And, you know, that, that's not just the translation thing, that's a, a different meaning. So. I think we can work towards a better better way of dealing with those uh, difficult ones as they arise. But overall, I'm happy enough with the policy and it's great to see uh, the support for it out in our communities and people are using it and engaging with it. So, Goramil Magad. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we now have uh, Councillor Bert Wilson on WebEx. Uh, yes, Chair. Well, just from my, uh, we get, put it back, uh, the decision for a month. And in that month, uh, the cost has already uh, been risen from uh, £350 per sign to £400. Uh, six months or a year down the line, uh, we have no idea what it's going to be, which it'll definitely not be a lot cheaper. It'll uh, probably have risen by quite a, a bit. Uh, so the final cost, we have no idea as to what it is. One road in my own area, and I, uh, the signs on that road, I think it's I say there are 50 or 52 signs that are already uh, that are on that road. So uh, I think if we go in and uh, do our sums, uh, we can be sure that it's going to cost uh, quite a, a, a an extensive. Uh, a uh, fund of money that uh, obviously uh, I don't know whether we have it or whether we haven't but I can see that it's going to cost a lot more than we expect or anybody expects for that matter on the general public but I just want to note that as a, as a Democrat I cannot nor will not agree to 15% uh, of the population or the dwellers overruling uh, 85%, so that is one of my main, uh, had it been 51%, yes, I would have uh, considered it, but uh, I will not, and I want to note it as well as that, that I uh, cannot agree to 85% uh, uh, of the, uh, the residents on their own being overruled by 15%. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilson, that's noted. Councillor Stephen McCann. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not too sure if uh, Councillor Wilson was proposing the rollout of dual language signage on his road there when he mentioned the 52, the 52 signs. Uh, if he was, I'm more than happy to second it. But in terms of the report generally, uh, Chair, yes, I'm happy to second it. And I wish to welcome uh, the, the, the feedback from the local community, particularly the Irish language community. And I want to welcome the engagement that's happened between council officers and the community in terms of this particular sign. And I suppose it is inevitable that sometimes uh, translations will be open to interpretation but we shouldn't underestimate uh, the local knowledge in, the, in these things and we should consult locally and in this case you know that local consultation and that local discussion has came to the resolution so it has so uh, but generally there's great feedback out there in terms of this policy and the fact that there's 250 applications uh, in the pipeline shows the 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 uptake and it, it shows how positive that this policy has been received in the community so uh, just to pass on that good feedback uh, John and happy to second the happy to second the, recommend, the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, well, Councillor Seamus Green on Webex. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I uh, want to welcome this as well. Uh, uh, just uh, to uh, take up on something uh, uh, Councillor Wilson said there. 
he said he couldn't accept uh, that form of democracy. But I'm nearly sure uh, this council has uh, has adopted this. Um, and as far as I'm aware, uh, more than 51% of the councillors elected by the people in Fermanagh and Oma voted for uh, this policy through. So I don't know what form of democracy uh, Bert's uh, talking about, but uh, that, as far as I'm aware, that's what democracy is. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly on WebEx. Thank you, Chair. And it's just a quick comment, really, in relation to following on from Councillor McKenna, and Councillor Wilson there, that, you know, if, if costs have increased from 350 to 400 pounds, that who knows what it'll be in the future, perhaps as an incentive for the local community, if this is what they want to apply for dual language signage in their area, while we know what the cost is. So I would say it is an incentive for the community to keep going if that's what they want. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Anthony Feely in the chamber. Yeah, yeah, th thanks, John. I was just looking at 2.2.3 then, John, was saying about the electrical office now being more flexy and you said you said go up and you had more hours up there, which is making it handy for you. But are you happy th with that, John, or would you, is there any hope that they could send the register down electrical to you on, online or that, or are you just content enough to go up and then still a lot of work, but you think it might make more sense to do it online now, but did you just try that or it's just as well? Yes, Chair, we, we've had a number of discussions with the electoral office and it is purely down to legislative requirements that they are saying there is absolutely no way in which they can make the electoral register available to officers. Um, I suppose, are we happy? Yes, it's a major it's a major increase in the amount of time that we have at one visit uh, when we go there and we make use of that by bringing two officers up to the electoral office at any one time. Um, so it is, we, we do make maximum use of that, but legislatively, the electoral office has informed, informed us there's absolutely no way in which they can make the register available to officers. Thank you, Anthony. And we go to Councillor Paul Robinson on WebEx. Thank you, Chair. No, Chair, I would not be happy with this because the, it seems the language has changed from one from the last meeting to this language to this meeting, and I wouldn't be I'd need to be uh, right the first time. So I'll not be backing this decision, and also on the cost as well. I'll be voting against it. Thank you. Uh, we've had heard this proposed by Councillor Mary Gardy and seconded by. Councillor Stephen McCann, and uh, already have Councillor Robinson dissenting, and uh, Councillor Wilson, I believe, dissenting. Uh, is there anybody else? Councillor Earl Thompson? Councillor Irwin, I think we're going to have to go for a vote on this, the amount of people dissenting. So, uh, can we set up a vote, please? Chair, can I ask what we're voting on? We're simply voting on the officer's recommendations that... Uh, we're taking them all together, Chair, is what I'm asking. Are yeah. we? Robert, you have to activate your vote.
Okay, thank you. So we have 16 for, 12 against, and one abstention. So that motion is, or that recommendation is passed. So we now move on to uh, item 6.2, and we go to uh, Director John Boyle again. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this report's in relation to Dumra Avenue car park in Oma. Uh, I think it was raised at a, at a previous meeting by a member uh, about the parking issues which resulted at the car park. Um, and th there are issues in relation to the existence of a through road uh, which exists within the car park uh, where a number of car parking spaces are on the far side of that car, uh, of that um, of that through road and are reclassified as on-street parking uh, rather than off-street parking for which the council are responsible. Um, th those spaces are uh, the responsibility of DFI and they're mandated under different legislation uh, than what the uh, off-street car parking is. Um, and there are uh, there have been specific rules in relation to them where they are limited to one hour parking with no return within uh, that one hour between the hours of eight thirty in the morning and uh, six thirty in in the in the evening. Uh, motorists and, and people who are parking there have haven't been able to differentiate between the areas which are on street parking and off street parking. And, and as, as such, many mistakenly purchase uh, tickets uh, for their vehicles, which really uh, don't apply to the to the parking spot in which they are if they are on the on on uh, street parking element. And in such in some cases, they have received um, uh, because they've stayed over the hour uh, for which is responsible for the on street parking um, that it has been enforced and they have received parking tickets in relation to it. We, we have engaged with the Department for Infrastructure uh, and we have actually observed uh, the existence of parking tickets on the on-street parking uh, side of, of the car park. Uh, and there are two potential options which we, which we'll explore further with DFI. One is the acquisition of the council for the on-street car parking spaces or the development of a lease arrangement uh, for the spaces. Uh, in order to do that, we will have to engage uh, the services of land and property services for evaluation. Um, and uh, if if it were viable in a future report coming through committee, uh, it would become part of the of the main P and display off street car park. In the interim period, um, DFI have agreed to temporarily suspend any enforcement in connection with the on street uh, car parking spaces, and and that is already in in effect. Uh, from the 5th of May. Um, so, Chair, in, in, it's recommended that the Council approves the further engagement between, to, between the Council and DFI personnel to explore the options as detailed in 2.2. Notes the temporary suspension of enforcement on the on-street uh, spaces at Dumra Avenue and notes the agreement from DFI to remove all signage referencing uh, limited parking times for on-street spaces located at Drumra Avenue uh, pending for the discussions and agreement on the issue. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, John. Um, I wonder, could IT sort out my screen? I can't see who's indicating. There's nobody in the chamber indicating, and it appears that councillors on WebEx, but I can't see who's first. I and, think I'm first according to the list here, John, the way it appears uh, on my screen. Sorry, Robbie. sorry, uh, I'm, I'm going to correct you there. Uh, Seamus Green, councillor Seamus Green, you're first on the list that I have. Uh, uh, Chair, I mustn't have put my hand down from the previous time, so apologies for that. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that, Barry. You are uh, next, Councillor Barry McIlduff. Thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, you'll recall that I raised this issue and brought it to the attention of the Council and had engaged variously with DFA Roads uh, in OMA about this matter. Now, the first thing I want to say is commend. I want to commend uh, Council officials through our Director, John, uh, John Boyle, for their excellent engagement with DFA roads on this matter. This is exactly what was needed. You know, um, quick turnaround, solid engagement, and it has yielded, you know, progress. Uh, so, obviously, then, I want to propose the adoption of the three recommendations, uh, the three element, the recommendation, which is three, three parts to it. Now, I would add the following. I would ask the council to write to DFA uh, to establish how many fixed penalty notices 
were issued at this location since the introduction of the signage uh, at that location. How many have they uh, issued? How many uh, fixed penalty notices have they issued? Also, how many appeals were made? And uh, how many of these appeals were successful or unsuccessful? Uh, so I would like that revisiting of the past as well. And uh, I would ask that in our correspondence to DFA, that we call for um, you know an overturning of unsuccessful appeals where people had uh, on their windscreens, uh, visible in their car, on the dashboard or whatever, um, these pay and display tickets. But uh, John gave the context very well there, you know, the confusion. This was very, very confusing for people. Every day I walk past those small number of spaces, I would see uh, fixed penalty notices on windscreens where uh, the, the, the pay and display notice was also there. And uh, people were terribly, terribly confused. I welcome the fact that there's a temporary suspension of enforcement, but I do want to propose the three element recommendation. And I do add that perhaps fourth aspect to it, where we revisit the past, ask that unsuccessful appeals be overturned in light of this retrospectively, and that people be compensated accordingly. And in that, we'd like to establish how many. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Barry, and we'll go to Councillor Earl Thompson. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to Director Boyle for his report. It does lead to a lot of confusion, definitely in that car park, there's no doubt about it. And I, I want to go to, uh, I know there's other speakers after me, but I want to go to the recommendations as well. And I want to second the uh, three recommendations as listed. And I'm happy enough to second Councillor McAdoff's uh, further proposal that there's further engagement with DFA to the issues that he's uh, outlined. So I'm happy to second, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. And we go to Councillor Anne and Jim Nassi, Anne Marie. Yeah, thanks a lot, um, John, and uh, all the best in New Year ahead, John. Um, just on that, I don't want to. Uh, go too much on it, just on what Councillor McLeod had said, um, just for the quick and swift um, response from our council officials and DFA on this, because it is confusing and we're trying to get people into the town and to shop on that there and to see a car park with everything sitting beside each other and no barriers and there is totally inadequate sign in there. So do you know what, it's, it's good to see it resolved. Disappointing that so many people have received so many penalty notices over so many years and um, that nothing had been done sooner but you know what it's highlighted now and it's great to see the response and i'm happy enough with the recommendations and barry's um other points as well i'd, I'd like to see that as well being carried across thank you thank you uh councillor stephen donnelly uh thank you very much chair and uh, uh likewise i'd like to welcome uh, these recommendations uh, i think that there are really two broad thrusts to this which is that this particular car park does enjoy a particularly significant strategic location in OMA in that it really is to maximum capacity at most times of the day and during the week, it just given the proximity to Old Marketplace and indeed to, to, to the wider town centre. And so you do have a lot of people there and having this position where you do have people consistently be confused as to what the terms are in terms of their own obligations and people getting caught up essentially. So seeing this be addressed um, is something that's enormously positive. And I think that if we can move to a situation where we see some re regularization, just in terms of what is expected in the usage of the different car parking spaces in this vicinity, I think that that would be enormously positive for people using that car park uh, and indeed for the wider town center. So just happy to lend my support, Chair. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Matthew Bell. Thank you, Chair. Yes, just also want to um, voice my support for both the recommendations and Councillor McEldoff's uh, uh, proposal. It's it's great to see, and I will also commend the the council staff that a, a quick resolution has been has has been found. Action has already been taken, and uh, long term solutions have already been outlined. So absolutely and fantastic. Uh, well done that. It's, a, it's just a great, clear example of positive communication and working together, coming out to the benefit of everyone. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Matthew. And it's Councillor Josephine Dayton. Thank you, Chair. And uh, can I uh, wish you well for uh, your year as Chair of this really uh, important committee? Um, I want to thank John Boyle for his report and uh, generally uh, add my voice uh, of support for uh, these recommendations and for uh, Councillor Michael Duff's uh, proposal. Um, I do feel that uh, there was unacceptable confusion around uh, the car parking here and it's good to see that we're going to finally get some uh, clarity on the situation. I uh, agree with other members who say that it's really uh, unfortunate and indeed unacceptable that members of the general public have been penalised uh, owing to uh, lack of clarity. And uh, I, I would like to see some uh, redress in this regard. So uh, perhaps that's something we can look forward to in the future, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, Councillor Lambert McAleer. Thank you, Chair, and apologies. I'm just joining the meeting now. Um, yeah, fully supportive of the, the recommendations as made. I think we do need to look at extending this from a temporary suspension of enforcement to something that is going to be permanent and long term because, uh, as other councillors have said, this is something that is a, a bit of a major issue in OMA in recent months. And when the, when the amendments were made or when the changes were made, it seemingly was done with no discussion or no uh, awareness programme from DFA to the public who had historically used that car park. And not only that, but there have been a number of reports that I've received, and I'm sure other councillors in the area are no different, of people not just receiving uh, uh, fines, but fines attached to the passenger side of the car. So obviously in their vigour to get these parking fines issued, they're doing cars from both sides to try and get as many done and maximising the, the amount of fines that have been issued. Uh, and, and people not seeing the fines maybe until they're home or until somebody else has pointed out to them, a passenger has pointed out that they actually have received a fine. So it's something that is quite serious and needs to be addressed and I'm glad to see that it is being addressed um, and again I suppose going on the outsourcing of some of these issues to the, the likes of the the litter fines and, and dog filing fines it's something that again would raise uh, very serious concern from my perspective whenever you go to privatise some of these issues that profit becomes king and uh, the, the quality of the work maybe suffers a wee bit so I'm um, happy enough to support the recommendations as noted and hoping to see a, a long-term and permanent solution to this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. You've heard the recommendation from Councillor McElduff for the uh, the officer's recommendations and the additional one to revisit the uh, issue of fines that have already been issued, and that was seconded by Councillor Earl Thompson. Is there anybody who doesn't agree with that? No. So that's that matter passed. We now go to agenda item 7.1, public convenience update, and we'll go back to John News for that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the purpose of this paper is uh, for information, just to provide a, a, an update on the reopening of public conveniences across the district. Uh, and members of the call, September 2021, uh, members have approved uh, the, the, the previous uh, arrangements for the opening of at least one accessible unisex toilet. And uh, since that time, uh, there has been uh, a, 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 a change, a significant change is now to uh, public health guidance and, uh, and restrictions and the removal of uh, legislative restrictions and a, a, a reopening of society. And over that period of time, <coughs> and I suppose probably the, the, the particular milestone would have been in, in the uh, the run up to the Easter holidays, uh, we had reviewed the, the reopening of a number of uh, toilet uh, facilities and amenity facilities across the district. And since that time, uh, then members had raised this at May uh, Environmental Services Committee. Uh, and we have been commissioning, there's been commissioned a series of deep cleans on uh, the remaining units that, that were still closed across the district. So Appendix 1 then has set out uh, the, the units that are currently open. Uh, the units that also highlights uh, the units that had reopened uh, from September last year and uh, notes in the the, if you like, the the end state that we expect to be in uh, with uh, most of the, the, the units fully reopened then 
by uh, the the week commencing the fourth of July. Uh, <coughs> I suppose what I, I can just uh, update members in respect of those deep cleans that I've referred to it at two point three. <coughs> Those have been ongoing now for uh, a number of weeks, and uh, I've uh, just heard today that we have seven units that are now uh, seven additional units that are, that are completed and will be reopening before uh, this weekend. And then we will continue to reopen the, the remaining units between now and the fourth of July. Uh, it's not a case that we're waiting to the fourth of July for them all all to reopen. Uh, <coughs> so the the papers presented are for information. Uh, and uh, just recommended that the council notes uh, the update on public convenience provision uh, across the district and the proposed future uh, openings uh, as detailed in appendix one happy to take uh, any questions thank you john i'm going to go first of all to councillor howard thornton uh, thank you chair and hope for you a successful year in office uh, i want to first of all clarify uh, with regard to 2.2 of the report, it talks about the locations in green uh, having additional units have been open since September 2021 to meet need. I'm a bit unclear on that because when I look at them, I look at you know some of them, Cash, <coughs> Muckross, Round O, there only seems to be one open on the date that uh, this this was updated. So how there was additional units being opened, I'm, I'm unclear. Uh, and the second point is 2.3. It highlights uh, the priorities the council have been opening uh, toilets and so on, public conveniences. And yet it talks about the high usage uh, uh, locations. And yet many of these high usage uh, locations are still to be opened by the 5th of July. And especially the tourist amenities to which I have a lot of complaints. Uh, and I know other councillors have had a lot of complaints as well. But we take, you know, the high usage ones, uh, Eaton Street, Head Street, Round O. I, I've had many complaints about Bellalec, especially with regard to uh, bank holidays and so on, and Carry Bridge. I'm sure other councillors can speak on those. But I'm wondering how these priorities were worked out, because it says that it's prioritizing, prioritizing high usage uh, sites and tourist amenity sites. So I'd like those uh, answered, please. Okay, thank you. I think I'll continue with the, all the councillors and come back to John at the <coughs> end. Uh, Councillor Victor Warrington on Webex. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, this is something obviously I brought up uh, under AOB at last month's AS meeting because, again, I had been approached, as a lot of us uh, councillors had been approached, uh, about toilets being closed and especially at the at the at the holiday time, uh, bank holidays and Easter, etc. Uh, I certainly welcome. I certainly welcome the ones uh, gone through the list. Um, I welcome the, the high usage ones that are now seen to be returning uh, to, to normality, and hopefully over a period of time, uh, the remaining the remaining toilets uh, that are still have 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 some of them closed, get get them open as well. So, so as I say, I welcome this progress on the ones that have been opened, uh, but certainly I hope that uh, that. We can continue <laughs> that they remain open and we don't have another uh, outbreak or whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. I'm going to go to Councillor Chris McCaffrey in the chamber. Or I'm going to Councillor Lee, just to be very brief and again support um, some of the statements there from my council colleagues about the reopening of these public convenience facilities. And I think it's important that we do get back there. Uh, I don't want to dwell on issues that have been raised with me, but likewise to Councillor Thornton, um, I've had <coughs> people in Benedict. Um, I've also had people from the um, New Bridge Road around Lisna Ski on the Derlin Road who are looking for those facilities to be reopened. Um, you know, tourist areas, people going on camping trips, uh, camping out, and you know, these public facilities need to be reopened. So I'm glad to see that we are having some progress towards that. Uh, and just I would just make those comments there. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And we go to Councillor Seamus Green on Webex. Thank you, <coughs> Chair. I'm uh, extremely disappointed. Uh, I I have uh, raised the this on numerous occasions. 
uh, in relation to the only disabled facilities being open. I have pointed out that uh, a lot of this is in uh, rural villages. I note that the uh, 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 correct me if I'm wrong. The only two rural villages that uh, is still uh, to remain as a disabled only toilet is Brookbra and Carrick Moor. Uh, I uh, have no idea why that is. It's not even listed to open again in the future. It's just put as, as is. Uh, so I am proposing that the Brookbra toilets is also added to open it uh, fully. I have no reason, uh, idea why they're not open fully. I think it's a way of cutting uh, already services that are already there. Uh, it's put down as low usage. But let's remember, if a coach or a, a, a bus or anything comes into the village uh, and one toilet is open, it doesn't matter if it's a low usage uh, uh, 350 days of the year, the other 15 is high us usage. So one toilet in a village uh, uh, facility is just not good enough. And I, as a local councillor in Brookborough, will not accept that we are going to be treated uh, both ourselves and, and I'll leave it up to the uh, people representing Garrick Moore to uh, uh, fake their case. But I will not accept that Brookborough is going to be used as second class citizen. So I am proposing that it is open, uh, ASAP, fully open. Thank you, Seamus. And we're going to Councillor Anthony Feely in the Chamber. Thank you, John, and I'll be brief here as well. Yeah, looking through this as well, and as everybody does, look at their own areas, and I see Garris and, and, and Derek Gonley is, is one use, but Belle Coo is, as is as if, as well, as is as well, so not open to either. So I would um, second um, Seamus' proposal there and, and, and trying to get Belle Coo open as well. Just a wee typo when I was talking to it on Garris, and it's, it's Duard Road, Garris, there's no N in that, it's D O O N A R D, there should be D O E R D, just, just a wee typo there. Second Okay, thank you, Anthony. And we go to Councillor Adam Gannon on Webex. Thank you, uh, Chair. For for a lot of villages uh, and especially in our rural areas, this is one uh, we have very limited uh, kinds of facilities, and this is one of the very valued ones. And it's good to see so many uh, getting back to normal. Uh, and I do uh, obviously I offer my uh, support to what Councillor Green has said there. Um, all these public conveniences should be fully opened as soon as possible, and we should aspire to do them uh, even potentially quicker than the timeline sent out. But I'm sure our, our staff will do the absolute best they can. And just uh, I notice, obviously, there's a few refurbishments there. Garrison, Urbanstein, Gorton, they're very welcome to be seen as well, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And we go to Councillor Donald O'Coffey on WebEx. Yeah, Chair, I just want to add more. I support to those who are making the argument, uh, well-made argument, that we have to have all these facilities open. It's it's literally uh, ridiculous, and I totally agree that it is uh, a step towards, um, you know, a, a, I fear, uh, like a move towards cutting long term. And um, I, I I just think it's it's um, every community has a right to a public convenience, like it's it's basic uh, provision. We pay rates in every area. People expect the service, so this shouldn't be uh, even a question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Donald. And we'll bring in Councillor Bert Wilson. Uh, yes, Chair. Well, I would support the councillors, uh, all of them, and what they're. And just the very first one on it there, Balna Mallard. Well, I know it was in a, last, a fortnight ago, uh, a car load that we're going through there on, uh, at seven o'clock. And uh, some of them wanted to use the toilet, and the toilet was locked at seven o'clock on a Saturday evening, when normally uh, towns would be well, people would be out on a Saturday night, Friday night, Saturday, any night for that matter, they could be there. But I think that yes, they need they need to be looked at, and uh, it's not good enough that uh, that that uh, is not available for the uh, ratepayers. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. And Councillor Diana Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. And um, yes, a, a lot of comments have been made that I agree with, certainly. Um, I just wanted to put the focus back onto the report uh, and ask uh, John a question, please. It's at 2.6 the energy consumption. 
Um, it's the final sentence as more PCs reopen, officers will continue to monitor energy usage, identifying opportunities for energy efficiency and increased sustainability. Just a bit of um, maybe um, clarity on that. Um, does that mean that um, new equipment will be installed? I mean, how, how is, what is the critical point at which um, energy usage, is it wear and tear? Is it age of um, equipment, hand drying equipment? Just if John could clarify, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Diana. And we go to Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair. No, um completely supportive of, of what's being proposed by Councillor Green and, and echoed by others. I think there's there's two particular areas of concern in, in my own DA, uh, Carrickmore Village has, has been highlighted, but also Gorton, um, where the same uh, is planned and there's no word or no mention of the additional toilet and facilities being reopened. I know Gorton there is a note that there is to be further refurbishment prior to April 2023, but we're a long way away from April 2023 at this stage. So I don't see what the delay is. So if we're addressing particular concerns, I'd like to add those two uh, locations to uh, the priority list, as it were. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Emmett. Uh, Councillor Barry McElduff. Um, I just want to add my voice uh, to the concern as expressed about uh, those public toilets that are not reopening and why. And uh, I was at a meeting today um, with library service in the Patrician Hall in Carrickmore just beside the public toilets. And uh, to think that Carrickmore, for example, is uh, one of the primary towns in the council area, um, Carrickmore, Drumore, Fintna, um, Irvinstown and Lisnaski, I think, are defined as five, you know, towns. Uh, and then we have other settlements, of course, and with the rural remainder. But to have a town without uh, access to a public toilet is just totally unacceptable. So I'd like an explanation, and I would uh, thank uh, Councillor Green in particular for the emphasis he has placed on this. Okay, thank you, Barry. Um. Earl and Anne-Marie Fitzgerald, you still have your hands up. I'm wondering, is that from the previous, or are you looking to come in on this one? I wasn't aware my hand was up, Chair. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no, it's not so that's all the councillors have had their, their say, John. So uh, I'm going Sorry, to let Chair, you... Alec here, my hand is up. At least it's showing up on the screen here. I wanted to speak. Okay, Alec, yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I hate just to add more uh, grist to the mill in this, and I don't like being parochial, but my colleague Howard there did mention uh, Bell and Alec, and I know there's different ways of looking at priorities, but Bell and Alec has just had hundreds of thousands, I can't remember the exact figure, spent by Waterways Ireland update, updating the jetty. There's a car park there, there's a marina, there's a, mug, a council mug, a council play area, and a council-sponsored walk route around the area. Now, if that's not allocation that necessitates a, a immediate opening, I don't know what is. Now, if I read this right, what's been happening is part of the toilets are being deep cleaned, um, and then they move on to another one. Well, surely that can't be an efficient use of time. If the staff are out there to do a deep clean, they should do the totality of the facility. Uh, and I just don't understand why it's not done. One other thing I would remind people of the radar key uh, system, and I believe those can be uh, for a couple of pounds uh, got certainly at the uh, the council offices in Enniskillen. I keep one in my car uh, and, and it gives access to uh, the, the disabled toilets. But as I say, going back specifically to Bell and Lake, uh, the, the, the list of, of uh, reasons why that should be uh, uh, open to, uh, fully opened is self-explanatory from the need I place there. So sorry to add more grist to the middle there, John, but uh, it, it's, it's just not working. Thank you. Thank you. So all the councillors finished. Uh, I'm going to let you come back in there, John, with some replies. <coughs> uh, thank, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Um, so, first of all, just maybe I, I, I'll, I'll hopefully I'll, I'll pick up uh, all of the, the, the comments that, that, that have been raised. The, the, the colour coding around the green 
uh, uh, units that were in it. So those were those were units that were reopened, additional units that were reopened. Uh, at, I think it was just in the week before Easter and the week leading up to uh, to Easter. Uh, so that's the, the, those were simply there to signify that those were additional units that had been opened from the previous position that had been agreed by council in September of last year. Uh, <laughs> that, so that's uh, apologies if that has been uh, if that has been misleading or if that has has caused confusion. Uh, the assessment uh, of you know you know something that's you know high, medium, and low usage that's very much uh, been based on uh, officers' uh, assessment and local and local knowledge of the areas of village orderlies within those settings. Uh, you know, given an assessment to uh, supervisors, managers uh, as to the level of usage. So it it, it is subjective. Uh, it is it's on people counters or, or uh, certainly at, at this stage. Uh, but it it was based on that uh, local knowledge, local, local intelligence. Uh, <coughs> you know, I, I know probably uh, you know all the, all the members who have spoken uh, been supportive of the reopening, and I suppose I probably just uh, I do just want to say that it. Again, if it has, if the table hasn't been as as clear as was my apologies, there are quite a few of the of the locations where we have been uh, uh, listed them as as is, and that's because uh, largely, you know, things are, you know they are fully, you know, uh, and in some places the as is is simply a, a restate, trying to restate that we were anything that was fully reopened we would be keeping it reopening and and, and where we have uh, highlights in uh, yellow on the the right hand column uh, the intention there was just to summarize that uh, <clears throat> that is all of the remaining additional uh, facilities reopening at those at those sites as well so the intention was very much to move back to a full reopening <coughs> across the, the majority of the sites and i've noted uh, councillor green's uh, comments uh, and uh, councillor McAleer in particular about uh, uh, the need to get uh, Brookborough, Carrickmore and Gorton Village uh, uh, fully reopened as soon as possible and uh, certainly I'll pick it up with the officers in terms of uh, a deep clean. Uh, the the assessment to, to certainly at this point to proceed as, as was outlined in the paper was based on our assessment of the need and uh, <coughs> that the need was being met with the facilities or with the provision that was that was currently there. Uh, the, on the specifics of uh, uh, about Balna Mallard, uh, that, that that was brought to my attention earlier today, and I'm, I'm following up on the specifics of that. We are opening. We're on. We are on our, our summer opening uh, schedule across all PCs, uh, and we have been for several months now. So that that would mean that that uh, our, our PC facilities should be open from eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock uh, every evening. Uh, but I, I will uh, follow up and uh, come back to Councillor uh, Wilson on the specifics. So, you know, if there was any particular issue in Ballon the Mallard on the occasion that, that, uh, that uh, uh, somebody uh, has, has visited uh, that, that particular uh, facility. <coughs> so there was just a, a, a there was a, a, so a, I'm go, if I go down for the, the radar key system as a kind of bird. You know, it's available at a number of our a number of locations across the district, and uh, <coughs> we are uh, rolling out a program to, uh, to further extend uh, the the provision of radar keys across the the, the public conveniences state. And uh, I've seen increases in that over the course of the last year, with more uh, radar facilities to be installed during the coming year, and look to roll out uh, improvements across the. The public convenience estate over the next number of years, subject to business cases and economic appraisal, uh, then we would expect to see uh, radar provision moving to 100% across the public convenience estate. Uh, <coughs> the, the, I, I'm going to say, hopefully, I, I think the final uh, comment there was specifically around uh, for, uh, the inquiry from uh, Councillor Armstrong about energy consumption uh, and the. Uh, so what, what, Trying to get uh, just what that's referring to is that uh, as you know we have as part of our com uh, commitment to climate change as part of the uh, the rollout of the estate strategy uh, we look to monitor uh, energy consumption uh, whether that's uh, water and the electricity uh, across uh, all of our estate uh, now certainly uh, PCs would be amongst uh, the the lower uh, usage 
uh, units on the estate, but nonetheless, uh, because we have so many PCs across the district, uh, when we when we look at them co uh, collectively, uh, they do make a, a you know a contribution, a, you know a, a significant contribution to our overall energy consumption. So as we get more facilities reopened, that will give us a better uh, understanding of what the energy usage is uh, across the entirety of the PC estate. And as we then uh, roll out, uh, well, hopefully uh, roll out a, a capital improvement program this year and in future years. Uh, that will give us more, you know, a better understanding of what the energy efficiency measures might be. So whether that's around, uh, uh, you know, water and and energy and electricity and use of solar panels and all those switches and uh, you know alternative approaches to uh, cleaning, arranging and sterilisation, <coughs> then all of those technologies can be uh, incorporated into uh, in the future uh, capital improvement uh, projects. Uh, sorry if I'm uh, if I'm if I've uh, galloped through uh, those points, uh, but I, I I hope that has covered uh, the the most of the 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 issues that that members had had uh, had raised. And I say, and hopefully uh, maybe uh, removed any confusion uh, that we are very much on the path to getting. Uh, you know all of the PCs. Uh, so there, there were a couple of exceptions. Members have highlighted those around the uh, Brookport, Carrickmore, and and Gorton. And certainly, so I said we'll take those uh, take those offline. Take members' comments on board and pick them up with officers as part of the program for deep cleans. Uh, I mean that is uh, as we've said the the program with deep cleans. It, it's not maybe it's, uh, again apologies, Councillor Bird, if I was given the, if I gave the wrong impression. Uh, yes, when, when units are being are, are being cleaned. Uh, that they are being reopened. It's not a case that we do one unit and then move on to the next and then come back to something else uh, later on. The deep cleans uh, are being undertaken uh, as quickly as possible. We have a, a contractor working through that process uh, over the last couple of weeks and we'll continue to work through it at pace uh, over the over the remaining weeks to the, the week start on the 4th of July. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm looking somebody to First of all, propose the noting of that information from John about the the public conveniences. Chair, if I could just come in on a point of information, please. Uh, quickly. Thank you. Just just to say that actually, it's occurred to me that in Bound and Mallard, it may be a resource issue. That that I know that the street orderly has been off with ill health. And, and you know, I know there's been um, temporary cover provided locally, um, and that the residents are grateful for that. But I think that may have contributed to the toilets being closed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Diana. So, of Councillor Mary Gardy proposing, and Councillor Robert Irvine Saglin. Seamus, you had made a proposal. Are you happy with John's reply to you at this stage, or do you want your proposal uh, put to the committee? It was seconded by Councillor Anthony Feely. Uh, yeah, well, uh, as long as John has taken it that there's a proposal uh, and seconded it uh, for it to reopen, I am happy enough if, if he's taken it that the deep clean will be done, as I said, ASAP, uh, and it's got a, a reopened. I'm happy enough if that's what he's saying. If, uh, I'll, I'm happy with that. Is, is that what you're telling them, John? Yeah. Uh, yes, that's. I mean, I've, I've noted uh, members' comments about those uh, additional. I said was I think it was a handful or less than a handful of uh, of those facilities, and said members had have highlighted them uh, for, for Carrickmore and Gorton Village. Uh, so we'll pick that up as part of the, the program uh, deep cleans. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you very much, Seamus. So that's that item passed, and we'll move on to. A Item agenda item eight point one, and again, this is for noting. This is uh, John Boyle. That's on the building control and licensing report. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's the standard monthly report in relation to licensing, and it's just a recommendation that the council notes the report on building control and licensing actions for the period twenty first of April to to the twenty third of May. Okay, I'm seeing uh, Councillor Earl Thompson ind uh, indicating there. Thank you, Chair. Thanks to Director Boyle again. Uh, happy to propose a recommendation, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. And back to the Chamber, Councillor Robert Irvine. Yeah, happy to second that proposal. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm seeing a number of hands up here. Uh, Sean Clark, your hand hasn't been up before. 
Chair, um, I'm obviously having technical problems because I wanted to talk about the toilet issue, but but it's gone. But, so probably yes, you know, I'm probably out of the. Uh, we'll not take any. But, we'll not take any smutty jokes from the chamber, please. Right, John. They're 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 trying to say things here. I'm just glad you can't hear them. Uh, yeah, sorry with I. that, Sean. Uh, if you're not getting in again. Uh, please shout out, and and I will let you in at a later stage. Uh, okay. Uh, I can't go on. So we'll move on. Okay, thank you, Councillor Maguire. I'm seeing your hand up there as well. Hi, uh, Gorham Margaret. John, again, I just uh, uh, I just want to voice my concern, and, and again put it on record that I see that the attacks on people has gone up to six on the dog stats, and it's just uh, expressed my concern at that. Uh, there is another one there. The attacks on other animals is four. Uh, you know, as I say, we do our best to provide the services for dog owners and advise them as best we can. But I think we we must highlight uh, attacks on people uh, at six is quite concerning. And uh, again, I think I did request before, and I know we can't get all details of all uh, attacks, but uh, as I think I remember yourself, Chair, raised an issue about quite a severe attack on a person. Uh, the, the the extent to the attacks uh, has it has anyone been hospitalised or the major attacks or are the what could be considered minor attacks but a, a, any attack by a dog that's not under the proper control of its owner I think is of concern to us as councillors just to raise that issue again councillor Margaret I left it there thank you very much uh, Tommy obviously that's a, a one that's very close to my own heart as well uh, John do you want yeah. to make any comment on that uh, uh, chair. Uh... Yeah, the detail of the of the report, and I suppose firstly, um, I think we have agreed that we would bring quarterly reports on successful prosecutions in relation to this. And I can assure members that in all of these instances, robust investigation is taking place in relation to all the, the attacks on people, livestock, uh, and and attacks on other animals or whatever. And we are bringing, and we have actually in 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 the past month. Uh, brought a successful prosecution in relation to that, and we will be reporting that on a court on in our quarterly report when we come to members. I, I agree with Councillor Maguire in that we have seen an increase in the number of attacks uh, from dogs. Uh, it is worrying, and it is something that we are putting resources into um, in in relation to the investigation process. Thank you, John. Um, I'm sure this is something that's something that we're all glad to hear, and we'll wait patiently wait your report. Uh, I'm saying, Victor and Alex, your hands have appeared here where they previously weren't up. Are you, either of you looking to come in there? No. Okay, so we'll just move on. So that's that item completed. It's, and now we go to correspondence, and the first item is 9.1, and that's reference the river pollution instance in the Owen Kalu and Owen Ray rivers. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is in relation um, to correspondence which we requested uh, in relation um, to uh, for to ask the NAEA to undertake a detailed investigation into the into the presence of UPBT substances in the Onkilu and Onray rivers. Uh, you will note that the NAEA uh, have have said that the the main route of entry of these substances is via aerial deposition and therefore cannot be linked to any specific river pollution. And in relation to that. They, they are saying that sampling of, of more sites would not generate a substantially different uh, or more information um, data set and therefore will not be conducting a further detailed investigation as we requested. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Councillor Emmett McAleer, you're indicating there. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, needless to say, I'm not impressed with the, the content of the letter, but then again, I'm, there's very little that this organisation does that it, that does impress me. Unfortunately, I think the 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 notes within the letter, in terms of responses made by the NAEA, really flatter to deceive. The correspondence that we received initially um, on the first two dates that that are noted in the the response, we had actually uh, tried to get a a meeting with them to clarify and to follow up on on the lack of information really contained in in that res those responses and the the meeting that we then that we did have with with the two people mentioned on the 4th of april was completely underwhelming now there was a, a from memory a six-point agenda 
attached to that meeting, that wasn't followed. Uh, and the responses that we got and the detail that we got was less than impressive. So I'm not going to rehash um, our original request because it's obvious um, how helpful they have been in terms of this so far. But I would raise, and, and I'm, uh, I'll, I'm content to note the correspondence here, but I would also uh, raise a proposal that we contact NAEA to request if any samples were taken for the survey that they mentioned downstream of Dalradian's discharge into the Owen Killew River, because that hasn't been uh, mentioned in any of the responses they've got. The idea that the these uh, substances are, are being kind of fobbed off as being something that um were were widely used for decades um before their conf before their their toxicity became known. It's it's really just trying to shrug shrug their shoulders and deny all knowledge of, of what's going on here. There is a cause for the pollution right across um, the north that we're seeing in our rivers and our waterways, and not just here, but elsewhere. And we want to find out what that is and how we can prevent it and how we can remedy it. And that's not being addressed by this organization. So I would like to raise that specific question with them and I'm proposing that's what we do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Emmett. Uh, Councillor Donal Coffey. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, I'm just happy to second that proposal from Councillor McAleer. Uh, I entirely concur. This is a shrugging of the shoulders. Uh, there's nothing to, uh, nothing we can do. Uh, there's no causative um, origins of any of these pollutants, which were never present previous. Uh, but, uh, you know, no investigations, no one's ever going to be held to account for despoilation with permanent toxins being injected into our rivers uh, into the soil and uh, it's 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 disgraceful uh, but as councillor McAleer said Northern Ireland uh, Environment Agency is part of the um, apparatus of the Department for Agriculture prior to that it was part of the apparatus of Department of, for, of uh, Environment and that uh, those were decisions made specifically to prevent independent uh, scrutiny of anything uh, in terms of government, but also in terms of vested private for profit interests out there who are despoiling our uh, planet and our environment from loads of money That's and true. nothing is going to be done about it. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'm totally happy to, happy to uh, second uh, Emmett's noting. I did, yeah. Sorry, yeah, second the noting as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Donald. And I'm not seeing anybody else indicating. Is there any anybody else? No, so we'll take that as uh, noted. And now we have uh, a letter from the Department of Infrastructure around the proposed amend to parking place restrictions in uh, Paget Lane, Ann Street, and Wellington Place, Enniskillen. Yes, uh, Chair. Yes, this this one and indeed the next one in in relation to Castle Street and Irvinstown is just an, an amendment uh, uh, or a proposed amendment. Uh, the Paget Lane uh, and Wellington Place is uh, from one hour no return parking to uh, one hour no return in two hours, uh, and that the state is in line with similar parking restrictions in Enniskillen. And uh, the the issue in Castle Street in in Irvinstown is uh, what is currently one hour no return within two hours to change it to a, a no waiting at any time uh, to except for loading and unloading. No, thank you. Councillor, oh, sorry, I have to write in. Councillor Mary Garty in the chamber. The chair, I don't know if you have to do them individually or not, but I'm happy to propose to note. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Council Howard Thornton on uh, WebEx. I, I propose second that. Thank you, Howard. Anybody else dissenting? Uh, Donal? Yeah, Chair, can I ask, um, I, obviously this has been done by the Department for uh, Infrastructure Road Service, um, but the one in regard to Irvinstown, um, I'm just wondering if it, we're moving from a situation where there's a one hour no return within two hours uh, to a situation where there's no uh, parking unless it's uh, uh, loading and unloading. Uh, that appears to me to be a very uh, dramatic 
change really in terms of um, access, people who may use that for, I understand that there may be um, uh, congestion associated with various points, but this is very uh, drastic insofar as it is basically excluding anyone from parking in this location at all, unless they're loading or unloading. Uh, I'm sure that there are many people who would perhaps use an hour here and there to do business, visit people, whatever it is. Uh, in whose interest is this being done? Um, uh, there's obviously commercial interest at some level, but uh, what is going to happen to, uh, like, is there any consultation on the impact this will have on people who might have used those car parking spaces just for uh, an hour without any significant congestion? What are they going to do now that maybe access issues, all sorts of concerns around that? So I, 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 I recognize uh, it's not our call, but perhaps uh, I would like to propose that we would just seek clarification around has there been any uh, scrutiny of the equality impacts in particular of uh, this uh, this uh, decision? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I, I can shed a little bit of light on this. It, it is the stretch along the wall of the old graveyard, which is the narrowest part of the street that I believe that they're indicating that they, that's where they want to have no vehicles parking on that small strip. I think you're talking about three or four cars. The vast majority of the residents have off-road parking, apart from the licensed premises, which has parking, again, built into the footpath at their side of the premises. But I'll pass you back to, uh, to uh, John here, who may have more information, but that is my understanding of what they're planning to do. It's the bit along the wall of the ancient graveyard that they're putting these restrictions on. Chair, no, I have no further information. We we can contact, if, if that is the proposal, we can contact EFI to see what consultation or equality impacts uh, have taken place in relation to the proposed decision. Is there, Emma, do you come in to second Donald's proposal there? Uh, Chair, yeah, just given, I suppose, that lack of clarification or clarity just at the minute, I would be happy enough to second that because I think it is a, a very important consideration to be mindful of, so I'm happy enough to second that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll, if was, we'll get the John and sort that out. Thank you. Uh, so that's all the, the business within the, the main part of the meeting, and uh, we'll now get to any urgent or relevant business. Uh, Councillor Earl Thompson had contacted me to raise an item. Earl, I have to advise you, you can raise your item, but we can't ratify it at this committee. It will have to go back to the full council meeting, but I'm more than happy to let you to bring it forward at this meeting. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Chair, for, for allowing me to, to speak on this matter. In fact, it, uh, it was remiss of myself, maybe others as well, not to raise it uh, at the full council meeting last evening in Oma. But I, I want to raise it now and I'll take on board your advice as well. And it's to do with uh, last week, obviously we had the, uh, from Majesty the Queen's uh, honours list and several people who reside in the Fermanagh Oma district were on that list. So I uh, just, I would like a letter to be sent to those people. Uh, from whoever is appropriate within the council to send the letter. And that's uh, namely the Right Honourable Dame Arlene Foster, Shirley McKay, MBE, Marjorie Aiken, BEM, Dr. Alan Cooper, BEM, Ivan Gilmer, BEM, and Gerald, as we know, Jerry Knight, BEM, and Ethel McClelland, BEM. So, you know, it, it lists their various services and what, what they've been involved in over the years. And uh, I think a letter of congratulations to each one of them would be very appropriate if this council can see the way to do that. I formally propose, Chair. Thank you, Earl. And uh, I see Councillor Alex Baird is indicating there on WebEx. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think I've got it right. Whether I've got the line through my hand or not, I've worked it out now. Yeah, sorry, I would like to uh, second Daryl's proposal there. It's something that I uh, normally uh, would have proposed myself, but I'm afraid 
uh, as someone once said, it was purely an overlookment. I overlooked doing it last night. Um, the recipients of the, the various honours cover the full spectrum of the community, so there should be no contention as to whether or not it should be done. And I certainly second uh, Councillor Thompson's proposal that the recipients be written to uh, by the uh, council, the appropriate representative of the council, congratulating of their of their awards. If we're going to get any sort of normality, this should not be contentious. Thank you very much, Chair. Appreciate that. Thank you, Alex. I'm just going to let you in now, Councillor Victor Warrington. Thank you. Can I ask uh, Councillor uh, Councillor Thompson and Councillor uh, Baird if they would include uh, Ian Landrum in that? Albeit Ian is, it was he was recognised for his work with the coronavirus uh, support group that he spearheaded, uh, and that was based in Fimeltown, but it covered a lot of people. Uh, in the surrounding area of Erin East and Erin North, and Ian himself actually lives uh, in Erin North and Clabby. So can I ask that the that Ian is included uh, in them letters as well? Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, I I know Mr. Landrum very well. Uh, I was going to, by people who who I knew were within the Fermanagh Nova District, and I knew that Ian was involved with Five Mile Town. But I'm happy enough to include that if it doesn't uh, go against any of our, of our other sort of regulations on those matters. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Alex, do you agree? Yeah, Chair, a seconder. I'm more, to, more than happy to concur with that. And just uh, in case there's anybody we have overlooked, if the list is rechecked and any residents of the area included. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And I'm going to allow uh, Councillor Barry McElduff, the Chair of the Council, to come in now. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Certainly, I've heard what the proposal and seconder have said, and uh, I will sit down with the Chief Executive to ensure that the necessary and appropriate arrangements are made You know, to recognise achievements like this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. That's uh, very kind of you. So uh, that we can pick it then that that's, that's going to be expedited from this meeting. So thank you very much, Chair, on doing that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, we're Chair, now. Sorry, that's a quick, quick word. Can I just thank thank you all for that? And also, can I? Uh, I did say it at the, before the commencement of the meeting, and I want to wish you well in your year ahead uh, as chair of this committee. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Earl. Uh, now, can I ask somebody? We're we're going to squeeze in here. Can we go into confidential matters? We have uh, Councillor Robert Irvine and Councillor Anthony Feely. Sorry, I'm sorry, I can't see over the top of that speaker. <laughs> really sorry. Put your hand up, good and high. <laughs> so, uh, if we can just stop the recording there.
It's recording again. Okay, thank you. I'm just coming out of confidential. I'm going to ask of, uh, Director John Boyle to sum up uh, matters discussed under confidential. Chair uh, Wilson, committee members, consider the confidential minutes of the the fourth of May, uh, and there were no matters arising. Members also approved the revision of a sales uh, price for a formally approved disposal of a former uh, civic community site. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, John, and. Thank you to the two Johns, and, and I wish John news a speedy recovery. As you can hear there, he's got a good old bark on him, and we, we wish him a speedy recovery. And it was good to see John Boyle back following his illness. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, everybody. I've managed to stumble my way through, through my first meeting here. So. And we've just made it inside the time with the five minutes we lost with our technical issue. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, those of us travelling home, we're, we'll do our best to make it home safely. Thank you. Well, Thanks, Chair. Good night. Thank you, Chair. All the best. Well, John, my... well done, John. And good luck in the year ahead, John McLaughlin, man. Thank you. Bye. You'd be glad when it's over, John, your next meeting's a full month away. <laughs>